I always have Let's planning for the same that. week as we have city council meeting, which is a lot to prepare for. Yeah. Within four days. Our package is over 600. Thank you, everyone, and, and welcome to tonight's uh, <laughs> council meeting. Um, before uh, uh, we get uh, started and, and, and call the roll, I just wanted to take a, a few moments to reflect on the, the, the previous meeting. Um, and there was a lot of people reached out and, and, and asked about the civil discourse and the amount um, of participation and the tone of participation. And I wanted to take a moment to apologize to the, the city manager. Um, there were a few speakers that called her out uh, specifically. Um, and I'm a big believer that the nine of us up here, you know, we sign up for everything we get. Um, you run, you, you, you put your name on a ballot, everything that comes with it. Um, you know, people are going to disagree. And, and they can be disagreeable uh, when, you're, when you're in political office. But there's a different standard for the staff. Uh, the staff uh, carries out uh, the, uh, the policy that, that we make and we direct. And if there's a problem with the actions of the staff, that really comes down to a problem with the council. Um, I would love everybody to be civil all the time. I think Portsmouth deserves it. Uh, I think you know, we have a great city full of great people. Um, and, and I think that we represent that city up here. And you represent that city out there uh, in the chamber. And I really do hope that as we discuss and contentious items come to the forefront, we think about that. Um, and just treat others uh, as, as we would want uh, to be treated. But again, you know, this started with apology and it'll end with apology. I want to be a better mayor, um, and I think Portsmouth deserves that. If I, I fall short, you can let me, let me know. And, you know, my dad gave me the greatest gift of all, and that's naming me Deglin. So, you know, nothing bothers me after I made it through third grade. So um, I, I just, I, I love our city, and I know everybody does too, and sometimes we, uh, we get a little hot under the collar. Um, but I hope that um, we can be what Pert Smith deserves, and that's a, a great representative democracy that, that comes together to solve issues. So with that, uh, Kelly, can you please call the roll? Yes, Mayor. Mayor McEachran? Here. Assistant Mayor Kelly? Here. Councilor Tabor? Here. Councilor Denton? Here. Councilor Moreau? Here. Councilor Bagley? Here. Council Lombardi? Here. Council Blaylock? Council Cook? Here. And tonight, Portsmouth, I would love uh, for everyone uh, here and, and watching at home to remember uh, Bill Elwell, who, who passed. Um, you know, there's, there's not many people that uh, represent what's uh, good and just um, and committed uh, than Bill did, um, and our thoughts and prayers uh, go out to his family, um, and I'd ask for a moment of silence as we remember Bill. Please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <clears throat> now we have a proclamation, uh, National Public Works Week. This might be cleverly timed to align with budget season, uh, but I believe uh, that it is, uh, it is definitely deserving, uh, and the folks, uh, guys and gals of the DPW deserve uh, this uh, this week, and, and I look forward to reading this. Whereas the American Public Works Association has declared May 15th through 21st as Public Works Week nationwide, and whereas the Portsmouth Department of Public Works, through its engineering facilities, GIS, parks and greenery, parkering, recycling, roads and sidewalks, stormwater, water, and wastewater divisions, is responsible for providing services to residents and businesses alike, everything from ensuring safe drinking water, a cleaner environment, and safe roads and bridges, to keeping our parks and gardens beautiful and our streets clear of snow. And whereas the 150 men and women of the Department of Public Works could adopt the famous post office motto, neither snow nor rain nor heat nor gloom of night stays these couriers from the swift completion of their appointed rounds 
And whereas the City of Portsmouth is considered the gold standard in terms of public works professional recognition, our arborists make us an Arbor Day Foundation Tree City, our wastewater our water, wastewater, stormwater division has won awards for the Pierce Island Wastewater Treatment Facility from the Water Environment Federation, the Associated Builders and Contractors of New Hampshire, and the American Council of Engineering Companies of Massachusetts, and from the New Hampshire Water Works Association. And whereas members of the DPW crew were responsible for helping to rescue a man who was trapped in the salt piles last year, but probably helped prevent accidents and rescue cats, dogs, duckling, and children on a weekly basis, and whereas Portsmouth DPW is centrally responsible for ensuring that the city fulfills its goals to be an eco-municipality, and whereas the American Public Works Association has adopted the theme Ready and Resilient for Public Work Week 2022 to remind the public of the responsibility the department has 24-7, even during a pandemic, to maintain the infrastructure, facilities, emergency management systems, and services that are vital importance to sustainability and resilient communities and the public health, high quality of life, and well-being of the people. Now, therefore, I, Daglin McCachran, Mayor of the City of Portsmouth, on behalf of the members of the City Council and citizens of Portsmouth, do hereby proclaim May 15th through the 21st as Portsmouth Public Works Week and urge all Portsmouth citizens to take a moment to thank the men and women of the Portsmouth Department of Public Works for the services they provide. Given with my hand in the seal of the City of Portsmouth on this 16th day of May, 2022. Thank you. There's no minutes to accept. There, I will give this, and Peter, you can grab that at some point. And now, um, recognition and volunteer uh, committee reports. Um, we have a uh, we have somebody tonight that um, well, I'm proud to to call a friend, and and everybody in Portsmouth uh, is proud to to serve us. Uh, Rochelle Jones, um, police detective. Is there um, somebody that's going to come up and, and speak on behalf of uh, Rochelle? <laughs> How are you? Good evening. I'm Lieutenant Tondro. Uh, is there something you wanted to say first? Well, I'll, I'll, I'll close it up, and I, I got a, a, a coin here, but um, I can start it off, and we sure. can start with, with this. Um, so we, when we all felt the, uh, I think everybody in Portsmouth knew something was up. Well, I knew something uh, was up because I drove by and Route 1 was backed up, and I said, that's interesting. You know, the bridge must be a really big tanker uh, that's, that's coming through. And I got into downtown, and I started seeing semi-trucks everywhere. I started getting calls. Um, what's going on? And I heard uh, through news reports that there was uh, there was somebody uh, experiencing a uh, a mental health uh, crisis uh, and uh, was uh, on the 95 bridge and, and through road noise uh, it needed to be shut down. Um, when and it's it's funny thinking about it because I I thought you know. Um, if there's anybody up there, I honestly thought it Rochelle. That's probably because I talked to you uh, more than, than most cops, and, and you have just a, a way about you. But you, you popped into my head, uh, and I don't know if that was uh, divine or not. But when I heard the reports later um, that you had used your recent training uh, to, to meet uh, the person uh, where they were, um, uh, to be a friend, uh, to be uh, accessible and to communicate. Um, none of that surprised me, and I don't think it surprised Portsmouth uh, to hear uh, that on that day, with that man's darkest hour, uh, you were the best example uh, of our city, uh, of our police department, and I think to a person in Portsmouth, we were all so very proud uh, of you, um, of the department uh, that, that, that trained you and and focused on these types of, of interventions. It made me incredibly proud to, to be the mayor. I'm sure it made every councilor incredibly proud to be able to sit on this dais. And I feel so fortunate to be able to present you uh, this coin. Uh, this is a coin 
Uh, it states on it, uh, the city of the open door, uh, and then it has our seal on there. And I love telling the story of the, the city of the open door because doors don't stay open on their own. Uh, they require a lot of effort to, to open in the first place, and we find doors all over the place that we need to open. Uh, this isn't the first door uh, that you've opened, uh, Officer Jones. It won't be the last. Um, and you've kept uh, the doors open uh, on, on your watch. And, and for that, uh, we are just uh, incredibly grateful. So uh, can the, the, the folks here uh, join me in a round of applause for Officer Jones? I'd just like to, from the police department side of the house, say a few things. And uh, I was not there that day, but I've certainly heard uh, the facts and how the uh, how the call played out afterwards uh, through a debrief. So, knowing Rochelle as long as I've known her, and to kind of echo what you said, Mayor, uh, certainly not surprised at the outcome. Um, you know, critical incidents like these, we hope they don't happen. Um, but when they do, we have to be prepared to make sure that we can uh, peacefully resolve them. And obviously, this resolution on this day is exactly what you know we train for and we hope for and again i'm not surprised at all knowing rochelle and knowing her um, she's a fixture to our community born and raised everyone knows her she can build rapport with anyone uh, and we often call upon her to help us out in doing that um, but again i'm i'm not surprised and i'm i'm thankful that she was there to help out uh, as is often the case with policing in our, in our world um, it's a collective team effort and there were a lot of men and women up there on that day trying to solve that puzzle and try to get that uh, that man into a better place. Uh, and I was happy to hear that, you know, Detective Jones was there to help out and, and to represent um, our agency well and obviously help to, to resolve it. It's indicative of, or she is indicative of the quality of police officer that we have here in Portsmouth. And we're fortunate uh, that when these things happen, people like De Detective Jones are there uh, and the quality and uh, of the services that we provide are second to none. So, again, I'm, she's well deserving of these of this recognition. I appreciate you taking the time to recognize her. Uh, it's well deserved. So I'm not surprised. I will give her the mic. Thank you again. That was off the cuff. That was not. Planned. <laughs> thank you very much. Um, thank you. You know. Thank you. All of you, I think this is the first time I've been recognized by City Council in my career, and I really appreciate it. And it's nice to look at you and know all of you from personal interaction. Um, I want to thank everybody that was on the bridge that day, especially uh, my team leader who showed up. And when he showed up, and he's the negotiation team leader, um, I just joined the team. I'm thankful to have been brought on it. But also, you know, aside from the police officers that were there that day, I happened to be in the spotlight, but that is something that officers are doing every day, all the time, multiple times a day, you know, for our community. Um, but also, I, I really was thankful to the citizens that were being patient that day and knew that there was something wrong and they weren't fighting, you know, with, with officers about traffic or anything like that. That was really incredible. And I'm very thankful to our friend on the bridge that found the strength and courage to trust and to try another day. It's been overwhelming. Um, I did not expect to be called to this. This was not um, something we would have considered a call out. You know, I was just asked to go and talk to somebody that I knew nothing about. And I learned a lot about him and we learned about each other in those 25 minutes. And that really comes from the training from the department. I'm very thankful that I have a department that supports me to be able to be in this position and to give that type of training 
to all of us. And I'm very thankful for all the citizens that I work with throughout the years, you know, people in social work, support services, just humans that remind me how to be a person and allow me to be a person in the position of an officer. I've never felt like we were separated. I've always felt like we're in this together. And those were the words that I used with them. And I believe that, and I know that you all believe that. So I'm, I'm very thankful for all that. And, you know, I think there's so many people that obviously it's Mental Health Awareness Month, and there's so many of us that have been touched by that personally, professionally. And, you know, I feel like everybody is talking somebody off that parochial bridge, you know, um, even if that means ourselves. So if anybody, you know, is listening other than who's in this room, I just always want to encourage them to not give up, um, to trust another day. Everybody is a hero to somebody, you know, and if you decide to live another day and try again, then you certainly have the opportunity to inspire somebody else to do the same. And I also want to thank my mate who has heard this story a million times and acts like he's heard it for the first time. And my best friend uh, as well that are my family and, and support me to be who I am so I can better serve the city. I love you guys. <laughs> thank you. Thank you again, Officer Jones. Now, I will say we're going to start public comment. Um, you do not need to stay for the rest of the meeting. Uh, if you, There's no Celtics game to go to tonight. Um, but if there's, because uh, they're playing tomorrow. Um, but if, uh, if you'd like to, to take off, please uh, feel free to do so. Um, and we will start our public comment uh, with our first speaker, Roy Helsel, um, the topic of audit committee meeting. And remember, if you're planning to speak at home, uh, just have your hand raised in the next minute or two so we can account for the time. Roy Helsel, 777 Middle Road, Unit 22. I, I was out of town and I was planning to go to the audit meeting. and. I get in and I come to the audit meeting at 2 o'clock. Well, I didn't get in until late at night. And I got to the audit meeting and I, nobody was here. So I found out that the meeting already took place. But when does this announcement that they keep changing, I thought we were supposed to get a few days on it. But I understand that the audit committee, which represents the citizens here, recommended somebody else to be audited, be our auditors. And it doesn't sound good because we have auditors that have been for 20 some years the same auditor. And it sounds like they're hiding something maybe. And people are suspicious of it. And I think that we should be have an explanation why they didn't accept the audit that was recommended by the committee. That's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you, Roy. Uh, next up, uh, Rich Duddy, Skate Park Fundraiser. I think this might have something to do with these. Oh, okay, never mind. It's a secret? All right. Would well, you told me about it before you? Mr. Mayor, City Council, my name is Rich Duddy, 56 Sweat Avenue, Portsmouth. I'm going to condense 10 minutes worth of info into three. All right. I'm a member of the rec board. I'm also on the Skateboard Park Committee. And I'm here to remind the City Council about our upcoming event June 9th from 6 to 10 at 3S Art. <clears throat> On each corner, there is a skateboard deck. These are two examples of the decks that we will be auctioning off. Uh, the one with the three monkeys is actually done by a Portsmouth High School student. And if you would pass that along so the others can see. <laughs> the one on this side is actually done by an auto body shop. Uh, and here again, if you would like to pass that along, uh, we have decks from artists, students, auto body shops, and many other items to be auctioned. The tickets are at 3S Art Space website or at the door. We have limited tickets, so I would advise you to get it on the website. All the proceeds are going for funding, the lighting at the skateboard pack, and I'm done. And any questions, feel free. Well, Rich, we can't take uh, questions during uh, public comment, but I appreciate uh, you coming up. My 
daughter just bought a skateboard for the first time, so look forward to bringing her to this. This looks really cool. Thank we have you, about Richard. 24 of those. Uh, we are going to have raffles so that the teenagers can, can participate. We're going to have raffles. Also, we're going to have a silent auction and live auction. So it's going to be a lot of fun, 6 to 10, 3S, and June 9th. So feel free to come. We'll be there. And Thank I've got to Rich. collect two decks so that some of the skateboarders up there don't make them disappear. <laughs> <laughs> Next up, uh, Gerald Duffy with the topic of civic discourse. My son's a skateboarder. He would just go wild over one of those. Uh, Gerald Duffy, 428 Pleasant Street. Um, Mr. Mayor, councillors. Uh, the new mayor has set a different tone in the council chamber. Uh, I personally love it. Um, it's healthy and I'm grateful. Uh, the broader public has, have noticed and appreciate it, and I imagine so do city staff. Uh, the mayor makes a point of warmly welcoming all speakers, regardless of their demeanor. His expectation is that elected officials have to develop a thick skin. The mayor tries to set a higher bar for civility. For instance, he uh, reasonably asks citizens to dial back the kind of applause that amplifies division in contentious issues. He is as respectful and gracious a mayor as we could possibly hope for. Given that, what happened in this chamber two weeks ago disturbed me. Uh, one resident compared the city attorney's actions regarding the McIntyre project to Vladimir Putin's domestic propaganda campaign against uh, denazifying Ukraine. <clears throat> it's that serious, he said. A former councillor and planning board member sitting next to her responded to the mayor's appeal regarding applause by waving their arms after people they agreed with spoke. Middle schoolers would know better than that. A planning board member applauded himself as he left the podium. Finally, our former mayor complained that he was bullied from coast to coast, then laid into our city manager, whom parliamentary protocol prevents from defending herself. I know the women on the dais can take really good care of themselves. But a 21st century man has to know the women are sick of being talked at, talked down to, talked over, and otherwise diminished by men for generations. I'd like to remind the previous council that they lost in spectacular fashion last November. I know from experience that losing can be a, a great teacher. I've lost more fencing bouts than I've won. But when I lose a fight, I ask myself how I contributed to my own defeat, and I try to figure out how to improve next time. I don't blame my opponent or suspect him of foul play, and I certainly don't presume to give him unsolicited advice. I know some people will go to their graves believing Michael Caine paid someone, usually me, to slip some weird zombie stuff into the Portsmouth water supply and make thousands of residents go bonkers and vote for their own candidates. But there's a simpler explanation. The former incumbents had their chance at governing. Voters preferred an alternative. Former incumbents have insights the city can benefit from, but they know better than anyone that little gets accomplished by grandstanding at the podium. They know that working for change requires more than sounding off. It requires interactive time with elected officials and city staff. To their credit, some of them are doing this in committee sessions. If they hope to be taken seriously in Portsmouth's civic life, I urge them to dial back the political theater and respect the spirit and decency this council brings to the chamber. Thank, Thank you, you very Jared. much, and have a productive evening. Next up, uh, Randy White uh, with the subject of the parking program. That's right. Right. Get that right, will you? <laughs> Randy Wright. <laughs> Hi. My name is Randy Wright. I live on Sudbury Street in Portsmouth. Uh, and it seems like the theme today is uh, how great it is to live in Portsmouth, and I can't agree more. Um, you're here because you love this city. I'm here for the same reason. Why well, I speak to you today not because I want special treatment or uh, I'm a character that has to have his own private parking place. I speak from my heart. Now, I've lived in that neighborhood that I'm talking about because I heard today, I found these notes on my doors and people knocking on my doors because I've been a pest about this subject for 30 years because I see what it did to my neighborhood. When I first moved, excuse me, moved there wasn't an issue. It was a pretty nasty neighborhood. But as the neighborhood became what it is, uh, the parking issue became intolerable. And uh, 
you know, thanks to people like uh, Nancy Carmer who gave us money to do that park over and whatever, I, I'm sure you'll all agree that that area has come quite a ways. And we five houses sold in the past few months, and three of them were in uh, seven figures. So uh, I speak from my heart. I can't say enough. I cannot express enough to you what your pilot program, which would be the program, uh, has done. It, it has given us back a neighborhood. Kids and people are actually moving in and having babies. We have kids learning how to ride their bicycle in the street. We've got that beautiful park. Uh, uh, the guys came in the last few years and put all new plumbing in and new streets and new sidewalks. You've invested in that neighborhood. All of you have. The people who sat in your seats have spent a lot of time. And I can't even fathom any of you accepting the fact that people go by your beautiful garages, they go by the money you're spending on the old garages, the renovations you're doing to the parking spaces in this city, to go over into my neighborhood to park. Because this is not rocket science. This is what they will do. And I have proven it. 8 o'clock in the morning, no spaces. 8.15. You couldn't park a bicycle on my street because people see the parking place and they park for free for eight hours, five days a week minimum. Now, I implore you, you have taken care of the retailers. You have taken care, Lord knows, the restaurateurs and, of course, the tourists. I am a resident. We need this program. And I know a lot of you are afraid of this program because you're going to say, well, they're going to want it. They're going to want it. It's going to happen because people are not going to put up with it out of sheer frustration. And you deserve to utilize the garages that you've spent the money on. And these people have them to park in, and they should, not in front of my house. Thank you all very much. I appreciate hearing me. Thank you, Randy Wright. <laughs> Next up, Sue Polidora with the subject of the economy and budget. Hi, Sue Polidora, 245 Middle. And um, I never thought that I would be speaking about the economy and budgets, two, is, two subjects that I try to avoid the most. Throughout my career, I did something totally different, but I was very aware of the national picture. And I just wanted to bring this point to you. I've already spoken about this last time when I, when I uh, mentioned about the national economy and the effects that happen when the national economy numbers don't make sense or so they go down. The Dow it was down 5,000 points in four weeks. Now, this didn't even happen on the recession in 1986 or the recession in 2006 or the recession in 2000 is a big, big number. And when that happens, it hits your 401k if you're working and it hits your IRAs if you're retired, which means that many of our retirees, depending on their income be partly subsidized by the IRAs have taken a hit. And those are the people that are your, your constituents. Um, they're going to have to be dealing with the evaluations and they, uh, they're going to have to be dealing with an increase in the water and sewage. You cannot, actually you can, but you should keep these things in mind when you're dealing with the income of the people that you were elected to govern uh, over. Uh, what private companies usually do during this time, because their stock is devalued, they either buy it back if they have money. If not, they reduce their force or they have a reduction in force. Um, many companies will have to look at this very closely with all the COVID and all that. It will happen at some point. So uh, to see that the city council is doing the exact opposite, rather than ke either keeping it the same or finding ways of making 
your uh, the administration of the city leaner. Um, you're doing the opposite. 27 new positions, really. Um, now, my question about the budget is: the last budget was passed was for 20, 123 million, which I'm only going to do the the whole amount. And I have a I have a couple of questions about that. Um, why was that not used as a base for the calculation for the new budget? Was $102 million, $23 million, the base that is being used for the, this budget is 126. Thank you, Sue. That went by fast, but I'll Thank come you. back. I know you will. <laughs> Next up, uh, we have Esther Kennedy on the wastewater treatment plant. Good evening, everyone. Esther Kennedy, 41 Pickering Ave. And um, I started my career in fighting the wastewater treatment plant um, and making sure that it was built right. After years and years and years, um, I organized with others to sue the city on the wastewater treatment plant. And it was based on the fact we did not believe it was going to be built right or it was not the situation was not being handled right. Um, ideally, it would have been up at Pease with a line back to Pierce to pump out to the ocean what was clean water. Now we got another dilemma. And you have a public hearing coming up or a public work session coming up on Wednesday night on the wastewater treatment plant, drinking water, and stormwater. We have had CSO events in dry times. That's against EPA, folks. So I want to know what's going on, and I figure Wednesday night's had a perfect opportunity to give us an update of why we're seeing CSOs if you know where I live, I live right next to the outflow of South Mill Pond, and I've noticed a little interesting stuff. Why we're seeing CSOs in dry events when there's no rain. Which, when I say CSO, for those of you who don't know, it's sewage that actually is being pumped in the South Mill Pond, um, and then it goes out into the ocean without being treated. And these are recorded. There's five of us that are on the CSO link, I believe, because it's um, they put all our addresses up and for emails. And then there's also a, a tweet for CSOs. This is an opportunity for people coming up this next month to question the EPA on our consent decree, on your agreement. So for those people in the public, I would encourage you to research this and let the EPA know that we as a city are dumping effluent into our waterways. And now again, if I'm wrong on this, because I have received these CSO alerts among the five other people that received them, then please tell us on Wednesday nights. I'm giving you an opportunity to clarify what I believe is a big problem and if it's true, it's against the law. So I appreciate that and appreciate your time, and I can't wait for Wednesday night. Thank you. Thank you, Esther. Next up, uh, Susan Page Trace. Topic, Portsmouth. Mr. Mayor, members of the City Council, I'm going to do something that I hate doing. <laughs> But I'm going to do it anyway. I'm going to read you a letter because, as the city attorney would know, I would be the most appropriate person to come to the defense of these two people after his help, which is a private situation. Anyway, do you remember your first trip to City Hall? I do. Whether to pay a parking ticket, renew a bicycle registration, pay real estate taxes, get a wedding license, dog license, register to vote, go to a meeting, or for any one of a hundred other reasons, you walked through those doors not knowing where to go. 
For many, a big, imposing, unfamiliar building with a new city. For others born here, and some in this very building, going to one Junkins Avenue is a right of growing up. Portsmouth is Portsmouth, not just any city USA. The city of Portsmouth, New Hampshire. So you got through those second doors at the top of the steps. You were greeted not by some ugly billboard with arrows, but a human being, a friendly face asking if she could help you. To be exact, one of two ladies, no matter how bad your day has been, or you think it will be, for one minute, life's okay. You realize how lucky you are to live here, or wish you did. A friendly, kind face, just as special as Portsmouth is special. Those ladies remind us why Portsmouth is uniquely Portsmouth, a small town friendliness in a city, a small town way of treating people, making residents and taxpayers and visitors alike feel special, helping people. The city actually cares enough and is smart enough to realize how important these ladies are, or did. They are the face of City Hall. They are the face of city staff. They are the face of Portsmouth to visitors. Warmth and kindness, they epitomize the soul of this city. So the very next time you go to City Hall, please say hi and consider thanking them for all the years that they've helped you. Sadly, the city of Portsmouth, while adding 27 jobs to the new budget, feels no need no longer to have these two part-time positions equals one job. For the life of me, I do not understand the rationale behind this. It's sad. Sad for these ladies. Sad for Portsmouth. Sad for who we are as a city. Someone has decided we need to just become another soulless city, caring little for those who need help navigating the city. Likely there will be some billboard or fancy interactive machine but no nice face to answer your question. Thank you. Please. I guess that's Portsmouth. Thank you to those two nice women. And I say thank you for all your kindness and help. You'll be missed. And thank you for allowing me to go over, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Paige. Next up is Jonathan Sandberg Bikes. <clears throat> Hi, good evening. My name is Jonathan Sandberg and I live at 160 Bartlett Street and I'm here to tell you that it's time for Portsmouth to get serious about bikes because getting serious about bikes means getting serious about so many other issues we say we care about. According to the city website, City Council voted unanimously to declare Portsmouth an eco-municipality in 2007 and signed a resolution which fully acknowledges Portsmouth's commitment and desire to become more sustainable using the four sustainability principles from the natural step by making thoughtful, insightful decisions that will benefit the community as a whole. The first of the four steps is reduce dependence upon fossil fuels and extracted underground metals and minerals. That was 15 years ago and we still haven't taken that first step. To say that we were moving toward reduction of dependence on fossil fuels at a glacial rate is an insult to glaciers, which sadly are receding at a much faster pace and we are taking meaningful action to prevent them from doing so. Getting serious about bikes means getting serious about fiscal responsibility. We spend tens of millions of taxpayer dollars a year building, maintaining, and managing all our roads and parking facilities. Bike infrastructure, by comparison, is cheap. Getting serious about bikes means getting serious about affordability. According to AAA, the average American spends about $10,000 on payments, gas and maintenance per car in 2021, with gas prices double what they were then, that number, number is likely much higher now. The fact that my family is committed to replacing as many car trips as possible with bike trips meant that we could get rid of a car, the financial savings from which makes Portsmouth affordable for us to live in. As a bonus, we're able to use the space in our garage for things more exciting than car storage. Consider all the additional affordable housing units, including ADUs, we could have if we didn't prioritize space for cars over space for people. Getting serious about bikes means getting serious about safety. Cars kill nearly 40,000 Americans each year, and there are about 1,000 car crashes in Portsmouth every month, according to the Portsmouth Police Department. 
Narrowing travel lanes to accommodate bicycle lanes reduces car speeds, making the road safer for everyone. But the most important safety improvement comes from getting people out of their cars, which are inherently safe at any speed. Getting serious about bikes means getting serious about green space. Consider all the acres of impervious surface in the downtown and elsewhere that could fit on the, um, merely for car storage. Imagine all the pickleball courts that could fit on the parrot or worth lots or the amazing rooftop gardens that could exist on the Hanover or Foundry garage if our priorities were different. I understand the political reality that there's a sizable portion of the community that views bikes as either exercise equipment or toys for kids. And I'm going to run out of time, but you guys need to take bikes seriously. Thank you, Jonathan. Next up, uh, Liza Hewitt, the topic of representation. My name is Liza Hewitt. I live at 726 Middle Road, and I am a resident of Portsmouth. At the City Council meeting two weeks ago, I clapped during public comment, and I'd like to explain why. Since January 6th, when the new City Council took office, I have not felt represented as a resident and taxpayer of the City. With consistent 9-0 to zero votes, I have not felt that my views and thoughts have been represented in these votes. Say what you will about the previous Council, and many of you have had much to say. There was always someone speaking for you and whose vote was representing you when the time came. If Councillor Lazenby, for instance, made a motion and as a resident you did not agree, then there was always someone else on the Council who verbalized another opinion that represented you. If Mayor Beckstead voiced an opinion, then usually Councillor Tabor <laughs> voted the other way. There was no voting block and everyone's voice was represented. That has not been the case recently. So two weeks ago, when you were taking a vote to spend $2.4 million in a payout to Redgate Kane, the councillors who spoke all spoke in favor. During public comment, there were many comments in opposition, some made by people I know, some by people I've never seen. They were voices that represented me, represented how I did not want my taxpayer dollars spent. I clapped in agreement with those that spoke in hopes that as a council, some of you would recognize my concerns as a taxpayer and a resident. I will leave you with a California Supreme Court summary from 1970. Most of you probably weren't alive then, but 1970. <clears throat> I quote, Audience activities such as heckling, interrupting, harsh questioning, and booing, even though they may be impolite and discourteous, can nonetheless advance the goals of the First Amendment. For many citizens, such participation in public meetings, whether supportive or critical of the speaker, may constitute the only manner in which they can express their views to a large number of people. End quote. I ask you to please be respectful of that. Thank you. Thank you, Liza. Next up, Arthur Clow on the topic of fiscal responsibility. Arthur Clow, 431 Pleasant Street. Uh, when I saw Progress Portsmouth come up here and talk about civility, I, I contemplated changing my subject to uh, why my $10 haircut looks so great or the miracle of, uh, of Weight Watchers and what it's done for my boyish figure. Um, we have a, a huge problem with civility. And following the, the last speaker that, wrote, that spoke, um, every one of you, when you became a member of this council, swore to uphold the Constitution, every single one of you, and it's long been accepted as constitutionally protected speech to, to clap, because sometimes that's all somebody has. They don't have their words. And it was dismaying to hear the city manager when people resorted to sign language and held up their hands that she said, what's with these waving hands? It's embarrassing. Well, we're a little bit embarrassed about you 
and we're embarrassed about how much money is going into the budget this year and the addition of positions and the lack of consideration of positions that ought to be temporary to use temporary funds and to be temporary positions. The city of Portsmouth got online and said, uh, from their web page and said, 10 of the positions are for COVID related school positions. If they're COVID related school positions, why wouldn't they respond to my questions? Are they permanent positions? Because COVID is a temporary thing. Every single one of you up here is supposed to be representing primarily the residents, not the city manager. But when I, I watch uh, the things that get posted online, it's like the cheerleading section for the city manager. What hope do any of us have, the working class people in Portsmouth that are a dying breed? What chance do we have here? If none of you are going to champion and stand up and question these expenditures and additions of positions, this is your job. Your job is not to align yourself with the city manager. The city manager has a large staff. They'd be happy to increase the number of positions. Everybody would like a break. I remember the days where you used to be able to go into City Hall at 4 o'clock on a Friday and pay a bill. But that went away during the Bohanko era. So I am, I am having a hard time with watching the budget hearings because I don't see any champions up there. I, I heard maybe one or two questions that I thought were at least asking, but what are you guys going to cut from the budget? That is your job, not just to approve it and, and be cheerleaders. Thanks. Thank you, Arthur. Next up, Brooks Stevens uh, on the Islington Street parking program. Is Brooks here? <clears throat> we'll go to Bill Downey. Who I do see, and if Brooks shows up in three minutes, we'll we'll let him speak as well. He was here earlier on the event. Topic of civic participation. Uh, Bill Downey, 67 Bow Street. Uh, Mayor, I was glad to hear that you said you were uh, always looking to improve, and I appreciate that. I know I continue to learn every day, and I love it. And uh, I want to speak about uh, your position and hopefully it's evolving, which it sounds like it is. Um, I want to use myself as an example. Mr. Sullivan and I have known each other a long time. I disagree vehemently on his position when it comes to the McIntyre. You all know that. We actually shook hands in court the other day. Like we might even have a beer. I have never interrupted him, and I can say with great confidence he's never interrupted me. I'm a passionate guy. My DNA requires it, being Irish. But recently I've heard counselors get into it with, with people in the audience. I know it's tough. It's one reason I didn't run. I think it requires a great deal of patience. But I think it needs to go in both ways. When people are at this podium, they shouldn't be interrupted at meetings. And that happened recently last week. And that, you know, I'm not asking for the House of Commons, you know, where they go at it with each other. But I think there's something to be lost if we sanitize the meetings without some kind of applause or some kind of reaction. These are passionate issues. And if you look, we got 15 people in the audience out of 22,000. I think we're doing a disservice by making it all or nothing. So I would hope you would consider allowing the freedom of speech as long as it's not disruptive. I did a fair amount of research on this. And most attorneys will come down saying this. It has to be a legitimate disruption. That means time frame in between speakers where it's unsafe. But as some of the speakers said previously, a clap is, is an expression. And as long as it's not disruptive, I know I've been interrupted by people in the gallery. Now, that's not going to stop me. But I think most people, it puts pressure on their argument, just like Bo needs a little bit of pressure. Otherwise, it disintegrates. So I would hope in the future you will be open to the idea of letting some expression as long as it's not disruptive. So thank you for your time. Thank you, Bill. Uh, that looks like all the speakers we have. Um, uh, just on the clapping, uh, there is uh, nobody that's going to say clapping is illegal or that you can't clap. Uh, but nobody is going to tell me that I can't ask you not to clap either. I continue to maintain that when it's a contentious issue 
and we are clapping and using that as a force behind of argument, especially during a public hearing where everybody does have the right to speak, I, I, it's not outside of my ask. Now, everyone in the audience, we're watching at home, uh, if, if you're clapping, um, you can choose to listen to me or not. But I will ask that when we are in the thick of thorny issues where we disagree and we need to find compromise, I'd ask that we keep our applause uh, silent so as not to drown out or uh, show a force uh, because somebody that, that might be on the fence about speaking in opposition, I want to hear from them uh, as well. That's my preference. Again, that's just a preference. It's not supported by any case law, and you're not going to have Attorney Sullivan up here uh, enforcing it uh, because it's not a rule. It's just a request. Uh, and if you choose to ignore that request, I can't stop you uh, from doing that. So that is hopefully, well, probably won't be the last time I talk about clapping, uh, but I appreciate everyone uh, that has reached out on that. Next up, uh, we have no public hearings tonight, and on to the city manager's items which require action. City Manager Conard. Thank you, Your Honor. We have one item before the council this evening, and it is a request to accept uh, bicycle pedestrian path and water services easements for property located at 3548 Lafayette Road. Recently at their February meeting, the planning board voted to grant site plan approval for a new 75 unit residential development located at that address known to many as the site of the former Wren's Nest Motel. As part of that planning board vote, the planning board recommended that the city accept a bicycle pedestrian path easement along US Route 1 or Lafayette Road, which is at, uh, Exhibit A in your packet, as well as an access easement for water services attached as Exhibit B. The bike and pedestrian path easement is part of the broader effort by the city to extend a bike ped path along the extent of Route 1 as properties become developed. And the water services access agreement simply provides the city access to the water infrastructure to be constructed by the developer on this property. The location of the easements are shown on the drawings. Both planning and legal departments recommend the form of the attached easements, and we would look for acceptance of, the, of said easements. Thank you. We have a sample motion moved to authorize the city manager to accept a bicycle pedestrian easement and a water service access easement from Monarch Village LLC in substantially similar form to the attached easements. So moved. Second. Second. Any discussion? Uh, I saw Councillor Bagley first, then the assistant mayor, and then Councillor Denton. Was that you? Or Councillor Morrow? Just a comment, I want to thank the, the planning board and the members of the city staff who are, have the foresight to think of things like this when projects come before them. Assistant Mayor. I was going to echo, um, I would echo the same um, sentiment that Councillor Bradley had. I think it is important as we look at our master plan and our um, pedestrian and bike uh, overall master plan that we, you know, as these new developments come online, we make sure that we are honoring them. And so I thank those boards and the city manager for this recommendation. Councilor Moreau. It's my great hope that we'll eventually be able to connect that and one of the big parts was to be able to connect that so that they could get to the um, closest bus uh, stop, which is actually across the street. But I think there's going to be eventually a crosswalk from like Hillcrest across the street. So this allows them to traverse from this new development down to that. So that was the reasoning. John was trying to make those connections. Any other discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Next up, we have the consent agenda. Let's see, is there anything that we want to pull out of that? Otherwise, the proper motion for adoption would be to move to adopt the consent agenda. So moved. Se second, Your Honor. Any discussion? None at this time? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Next up, presentations and written communications. Uh, first up, email correspondence. Sample motion moved to accept and place on file. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Next up, uh, we have a letter from Chris Rose, Portsmouth Middle School, eighth grade science teacher regarding impactful energy proposals. A sample motion 
Move to refer to the Sustainable Practices Blue Ribbon Committee for a report back. So moved. Second. Any discussion? It looks like we've got a couple. Uh, <laughs> Council Lombardi uh, and Council Moreau. And just before I get into the discussion, I wanted to read off the names of the eighth graders, if <clears throat> Council will indulge me. Uh, it is Maddie Ball, Lucy Demeco, Lily Patterson, Amelia Greco, Amelia. Uh, Emily uh, Greco, Amelia Kimball, Elise Katzenstein, Turner LaDuke, Samantha Huber, Chloe Randell, and Ginger Vonsagera. Uh, your parents and your city are probably, or your city is proud, I'm guessing your parents are equally as proud uh, as we are for reading through these uh, was, was quite uh, I impressive and exhausted in the detail, uh, and it's great to know. Councilor Lombardi. Uh, yes, thank you, Mayor. I, um, I want to connect this to uh, th these proposals are fantastic. The, uh, and it's really um, a credit to the teachers and the students, uh, both the teachers and the students who have um, offered these up. I would also like to connect it to uh, the meeting I had with the um, Economic Development Committee at the high school, which was hosted by, uh, well, the, the uh, Courtney Richings and the, uh, the wonderful staff of the CTE program and, and the students of that program. We have an amazing school system, and I think that um, both of these things have just demonstrated um, how creative and how um, important uh, these programs are. So uh, I just had that comment. Thank you. Thank you, Council Lombardi. Council Moreau. Yeah, I'd just like to say that I've actually had the opportunity to meet the um, teacher, and after reading through all of the um, reports that he submitted to us, I, um, I, learned, I learned many new things that I did not know. So <laughs> I think it's really exciting when someone has spent as many years in school as I have that you can still learn something new from an eighth grader. So kudos to the teacher. Ooh. Thank you. <laughs> I'm pretty sure there was a show. Are you smarter than an eighth grader? Eighth grader? It was a fifth grader, I oh, think. Grader. <laughs> I was really felt uh, disappointed in my own mental acumen <laughs> watching that. Councillor Bagley. Uh, thank you, Your Honor. I, I just wanted to echo you know, how great this is that a teacher is proactively involving the students with not only challenging scientific issues, but involving them in civic government and uh, I don't know if it was by accident or, or uh, extremely savvy, but I did notice that uh, Councilor Blaylock's restaurant was identified as a place for uh, solar <laughs> power, yeah. and that, as well as the building that uh, Councilor Denton lives in. So uh, kudos to the kids to uh, really pinpoint the target. Any other discussion? Well, I, I'm excited for the report back, um, and you know, if there's uh, other committees that could be involved from that report back, I'd hope the Sustainable Practices Blue Ribbon Committee uh, would make those uh, recommendations. Um, and again, a, uh, a thank you um, to uh, to uh, Mr. Rose, uh, the middle school teacher. I I remember my uh, eighth grade science uh, middle school teacher, uh, Mr. Layton, um, and uh, it's. You leave an impression, and and hopefully um, these kids will will get to leave an impression on Portsmouth in terms of projects that we take up in the near future. So, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Next up, a letter from uh, Michael Simchek regarding the McIntyre sample motion. Be to move to accept and place on file. So moved. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Letter from Hannah Taylor requesting permission to hold boot camps in Prescott Park. Sample motion moved to refer to the city manager with authority to act. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Uh, next up, I knew there was some movement coming from the back. <laughs> They're following along in the agenda. All right. Well, we have a presentation uh, regarding Middle Street bike lanes. Mr. Mayor, if I can introduce Deb Finnegan from WSP. She's a PE, and she's here to speak on the work of their group. Thank you, Deb. 
You are very welcome. Um, I am Debbie Finnegan from WSP. I'm a senior project manager for the company, and we were assigned this task, which I was very excited about because I used to work for Portsmouth long ago as a municipal engineer. So this is kind of cool to be back um, to say that. So this project started out uh, last year, and it started as a. We're not going to look at the presentation. Or do you want me to just wing it? She's working on it. Oh. <laughs> I can just wing it. It's all good. <laughs> Sometimes um, it's better that way. Just I swear it is. I do really good with the winging, you know. Um, so next slide, because it's been great to work with Peter, Eric, and Tyler. It's nice to see Eric back as well. Um, came back in the middle of when we were doing this project. So this project started out as a directive from, from not this group, but the previous group, previous council, uh, to look at modifying the bike lane between Cabot and Lincoln. Uh, and in the hopes to maintain the state and federal funding for the entire project. Next slide. Uh, next slide again. Uh, this is the project background. You asked to be on the tip. It was funded. You went through the design process. Um, it went out to bid. It was constructed. And then there were some modifications. And the modifications were the bollards were taken, removed. And then the next modifications were on the outbound side, blacking out some pavement markings, adding a rectangular rapid flashing beacon and a crosswalk at Aldridge, as well as adding some additional signs. Um, next slide. These were, these were also the actions that were, that were taken uh, by, sorry, city council, uh, just the same rectangular rapid flashing beacon with a crosswalk, uh, making Lincoln Avenue, Lincoln, excuse me, a bike boulevard. And then last but not least, uh, moving the parking spaces from where they were after the initial construction to the curb and then blacking out the spaces, like the pavement markings on that side of the street. Next slide. This will be an easy go through. Uh, this is just what, so people know, this is what it looked like before, the, before all the construction. Um, the next slide is what it looked like directly after the construction. And then the next slide is what it looks like today. The next couple slides, so the next slide please. And then the next one. And then the next one. So our role was to take a look at the existing and past conditions, look at speed information, parking information, um, how many bikes were using the roads, things like that. So we, we were looking at all this data. And then the other thing we were asked to do is do a door-to-door -door survey for the residents of, of Middle Street from Cabot uh, down to Lincoln, um, residents and businesses. So we did that. We had a public meeting on May 5th, I want to say, and then uh, May 9th. And then the next day, May 10th, is when they went out and did the door-to-door -door survey in that area. That also required, like if they nobody was home, we left a postcard that had a QR code on it where they could go online and fill out the survey if they so choose. Um, and the survey stayed open until the end of March, April. March. End of March. Thank you. Peter. <laughs> <laughs> and so then our next goal was to um, uh, take the survey and, and just document what everybody said. And then the other part, which was to do the evaluation and provide a memorandum. Next slide. Uh, this was the, what I just explained about the survey, so we can go to the next slide. Um, this is probably of some interest. There was 290 um, uh, responses, 158 identified of themselves as living in that section of Middle Street. Um, 158 of them were either businesses or residents, 97 were residents um, of outside of middle, that's that corridor of Middle Street, and then there were, two, of those 290, 255 people lived or worked in Portsmouth. 48% uh, of the people said stated they used the bike lane on that section of road, and 74 stated that they used the pedestrian facilities. Next slide. Uh, we had some positive uh, responses, which you can see on the slide. And there were more responses than this, but I just picked out some so you kind of got a gist of what a lot of them said. And then the next slide shows some of the, I would say the, I call them other responses. They weren't necessarily negative, but they were not necessarily positive either. They are just statements to them of fact, I think. Um, and the they that, because I would ask at the, at the parking and traffic committee meeting, I was asked what they is. They is the actual bike lanes, not they a person. So on the bottom one, it says they are dangerous to vehicular traffic. They was bike lanes, just so we understand that. Um, next slide. 
Uh, this is my recommendation. My recommendation is to leave the parking as it is um, for the stretch of corridor. Uh, the, the change here will be that the at um, Lincoln it will go the the bikes will actually go into a designated bike lane. So the the signage that is at Cabot or just a little past Cabot that has them go onto the bike lane, we'll take those signs and move them down here. And then at Cabot we will add uh, a new sign with the bike single bike bike sing, bleh, symbol <laughs> and um, share the road, I think is what I recall. Next slide. Share the road, yep. So uh, the different colors mean the blue is where the parking is, the red is no parking, and then the sort of, well, the teal color is parking, and the red is no parking, and then the blue is the handicapped spaces. The other recommendation I have is to provide um, their uh, shared pavement markings, which is, they're called sharrows, um, after every intersection. And then if there's a, if there, if between intersections is lying 250 feet, add one in the middle. That's the requirement that we're supposed to follow. Next slide, we'll sh and that's it. I was trying to make this really short because I'm sure you guys have heard all of this before. <laughs> or maybe not my part, but have been discussing this project for a while. So I was trying to do it quick. So if you had any questions, please ask. The Middle Street Bike Lane Project has gone on uh, for a little bit. Uh, oh. So I appreciate uh, the presentation. <laughs> uh, does anyone on the council have any questions for Ms. Finnegan? Councilor Cook. Uh, thank you, Your Honor. And thank you so much for your presentation tonight. You're welcome. Uh, and for the information that you've provided, um, it, it actually is very helpful. Um, I do have a question. I'm not sure if you have the data or if um, uh, we have it somewhere else in the city. Um, when I was going through crash the crash data, um, it, in particular, we only have the data here from two, 2020 on, on what occurred. And I don't have data from 2021 when the when the bike lanes were removed. And I'm wondering what the difference is between those two times as far as vehicle crash data, not pedestrian car or bicycle car, but car car data, because that's what we have here for 2020. That's the 2020 data was all the data we received. Okay. And and in that data, they were, there were line items in an email that stated what they were and none of them had any, it were strictly cars. That's why that data is in there. So it was either um, a hit and run. There was a couple that were hit and run. There was one that was an angle accident, meaning somebody pulled out of the pulled out of a side street and hit somebody going on Middle Street. And the other one was uh, somebody crashed into a car and did not leave the scene. So, right. Um, can I follow up? Yep. Um, I guess then, I would love to see the data data for 2021 after the lanes were removed, because this 2020 data is when we had. Um, separated lanes so it's really hard to to for this to be useful in any way to me and I know that that you didn't receive it so I guess that's really a question for the city is you know I need the comparison data to to really understand the differential there um, as far as vehicle safety goes on the road Is that a question? It's not a question not for Not a question, Finnegan. but it's... Uh, for the city manager, would you like to respond? Or? Sure. I I'm wondering if um, Peter Ice or Eric Eby had that data or if it's something we need to obtain from the police department. The, the data is typically provided by... Well, it is provided by the police department. Mm -hmm. And based on the data that we received, and, and we get monthly reports from the, um, the police, so if we did not receive any additional crash data for the last year... Uh, it would indicate that there were no vehicular crashes along that section of roadway. I will confirm that though, because we do get we do get crash data at the Park and Traffic and Safety uh, Committee. So if it was if there was data, it would have been supplied. Okay. So I'm you know uh, you know it, it, I will confirm that. Um, but I believe the the anecdotally, I have I would have heard if there was an increase in accidents or if there were accidents along that section of road because it is such a highly scrutinized section of roadway, uh, and we have not heard uh, any challenges associated with that section of roadway since we did this modification. Thank you, Peter. Councillor Bagley. Yeah, thank you, Your Honor. Thank you, Ms. Finnegan. Um, I had the advantage of seeing this presentation in the Parking, Traffic, and Safety meeting, and I asked you a question there. I'm going to ask it again. Um, you're recommending the Sharrows, uh, but my understanding is an alternative of unprotected bike lanes would also be 
just as feasible or, or would meet all the requirements so we get to keep the money and, and any Correct. constraints we might have. So it's really, um, I want to thank you for putting the presentation together and it's it's kind of a maybe a preference of the council which way they want to go, but either option would be acceptable in your expertise. Yes, and I and I back check because I just, it's, uh, I wasn't 100% uh, clear to, to be honest to make sure that the date, whatever you were supposed to do, like 25 miles an hour, they recommend shared lane markings. Mm -hmm. 35 miles an hour or above, they recommend bike lanes. And I looked at, it's posted at 25 in that section. The 85th percentile speed is somewhere between 29 and 33. So it really falls in the middle where there's no real guidance. So what I did, the decision I made with this was that it's been out there with no pavement markings of any kind and that it's there's parking there now and it's not defined. So I think moving forward, you just find, define that parking as well as the sharrows and it's essentially what's out there today, just better marked and better signed and things like that. However, that being said, yes, you could put in a, put in a bike lane and that bike lane you would put it at the outside edge is about 14 and a half feet off the curb. So you have like eight feet of parking, a foot and a half for the, for the door hits is what they call it. There's a better word for it, but you know, when you open your door, you want to make sure you're not going to hit the bicyclists, you know, or they, you know, cause that's bad. And then the five feet for the actual bike lane. Great. Thank you so much. Yep. Thank you, Councillor Bagley. Councillor Moreau, then I'll go Councillor Lombardi, and then Councillor Tabor. I happen to have the bonus of coming out of Cabot Street onto Middle Street to go to my office every day and drive it all the way to Lafayette Road. Um, so I've gotten the experience. I've been doing that since 2018, five days a week <laughs> in both directions. So I've had a lot of experience on this road. And I have to say, moving the parking back over to the curb, I truly do believe is a great idea because it's allowed more flexibility when emergency vehicles are coming because there was a lot of trouble trying to get out of the way of an emergency vehicle when they had it the other way around. So I do agree with that. But I, I also agree with Councillor Bagley that maybe adding the defined sort of bike um, you know, markings in the road as far as where if somebody's going to stay on Middle Street inside the parked cars, if there's enough room there to do it, that actually make, because I think it'll keep the cars, some really kind of go this way and this way all over the road. So it'd be nice to give them more definition though. This is your lane. Let's try to stay in it unless there's truly a reason to get out of it. So I would definitely be in, vote in to, to add Sharrows and if they had enough room to do the bike lanes as you were just discussing. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Lombardi, Councillor Tabor, and Councillor Blaylock. Councillor uh, Yes, thank you, Mayor. I, um, I live on Aldrich Road, yeah. and uh, so I use middle all the time. It's um, one of the issues that happened when they moved the cars back to the, the side of the road, uh, the parking back to the side of the road. Um, the traffic lane was um, offset. It was not not down the center of the road, um, and so one of the things that I've had happen there, and is that um, people try to pass you on the right um, in that area, um, and so I think in the area from I'm going to say from Cabot to Lincoln. Lincoln. There, there might be good to have a designated lane because I think there's room for it on the outbound side, unless you unless you move the traffic center traffic lane or lines to the center of the road again. Um, right. That's what I believe. I think part of the problem that out there anyway is that the the lanes aren't my, like. There's not a fog line, for example, like a white edge line. I yeah. think you need it, whether it's to define the parking, whether you define the parking per space or you just define that this is this is the fog line and whether you put chairs or a bike lane, that's up to you. But I definitely agree that there, it's not defined and it needs yeah. to be. I think that's a huge problem. So yes, I agree with you. Okay. You well, just said you. it in a different way, but yeah. yeah. <laughs> so Councillor Tabor and then Councillor Cook, second bite of the apple. Then we'll go to Councillor Denton, then Councillor Cook. <laughs> Um, thank you, Your Honor. The, um, I think moving the cars back, as your, your conclusion stated, it was the, the previous configuration with the cars creating the protected bike lane was confusing to motorists, and I, I think that was the experience. If we go with the option of 
uh, a painted bike lane. Mm -hmm. And we can get a couple of feet for door swing to protect the bikers that way. Can we also get a foot or two of, um, of buffer, um, you know, maybe diagonal striping, something like that? I was going back to the original 2015 options. And uh, one of the options was um, a buffered bike lane. That's different from a protected bike lane. <laughs> buffered bike lane was uh, cars, door swing, uh, five feet of bike lane, and or four feet of bike lane, and then some striping okay. to give that extra two feet between the bikers and the and the cars uh, on Middle Street. Would that would be able to fit that? Because that originally was the better option of the, you know, of the stripes, striped lanes beside the cars. I'm not 100% sure. To be honest, I think you could. I think there's enough space. I don't know if you could have five feet and then two feet, like to eight. Typically, it's a four foot and then a two foot. But yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. So it's a six foot total. So that, I mean, it's It's, it's an extra re foot. It's so. just additional paint. Yeah. Peter, if you're going to speak at the microphone, Kevin wants you up there. <laughs> we, we can accommodate that. <laughs> Well, I think we just want to make it as as accommodating uh, for everybody as possible, you know, and that extra buffering on the on the through traffic side gives a little more protection. Like Peter said, it's paint. I think it boils down to you know any of these options will work. I I think that you need to paint it. I guess that's the bottom line for me. Um, you need to paint it and have some better signs or addition, not better signs, but additional signs. Um, and however you decide you want to do that, any of those three options we just talked about will work um, and they meet the standard. And that's really what you want to do in terms of the DOT and, and keeping the federal state funding. So. Thanks. Yep. Yeah. Uh, Councilor Denton, then Councilor Cook. Thank you. More just a comment as a uh, <laughs> As someone whose bicycle is their primary mode of transportation, I've always felt safest when they're sharrows and not bicycle lanes because if I'm moving as fast as the cars or close to as fast, the safest spot for me is next to the yellow line so no one tries to pass me. But with that in mind, most of the people whose bicycle lanes are for are not people like me. They're for families or people who are now riding on sidewalks. So my strong preference would be as much bike as go lane as possible. Thank you, Councilor Denton. Councilor Cook. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, I really have just a, a few comments about this as well. Um, uh, first of all, I appreciate all the work that's gone into this. I know how many years <laughs> have been invested in this process, and um, it, it's been a long one, and there's been a lot of debate in the community around it. Um, my preference would be that when this comes up in the CIP budget, which hopefully um, repaving, when repaving Middle Street comes up, that we don't just look at repaving Middle Street, we look at a complete redesign of Middle Street that involves a dedicated protected bike lane um, that is away from the curbing so that vehicles can park at the curb, but the bike lane is dedicated and protected. Um, so I would like to see designs around that when we are talking about the CIP budget down the road. And I realize that right now we're not there yet, um, but we'll be getting there fairly soon. Um, so that would ultimately be my preference. Um, as it is, I feel like we have to accept um, what is um, the best option for now, um, because we already have a paved roadway. And um, like Councillor Denton said, um, uh, he is a fantastic cyclist. I am considered a weekend cyclist. Um, I would never, ever ride on Middle Street because I don't feel safe there. Um, I wouldn't feel safe letting my 16-year-old ride on Middle Street, especially with Sharrows. Um, I, there's no way I can keep up with the speed of traffic. And I think that that's one of the real challenges that we're dealing with when we talk about having Sharrows. 
So I think that we should do what we can to avoid Cheros because looking at all the, the data that we were giving, you, you look at the numbers of cyclists, you see it drops off right about the time school drops off. I'm thinking about the number of kids that are cycling to high school on Middle Street and I want them to be protected just like I'd want my 16 year old to be protected. Um, so I would argue very intensely that we find a way to add a bike lane um, not necessarily where they were before. I th do think that was very confusing to um, residents with the parking in the middle of the street. Um, if you haven't seen that regularly, um, I think that if you've traveled a lot in, in Canada, you see it, but it, we, we, don't, we haven't done that a lot in the US yet. So people are not accustomed to that. It's reasonable to put a bike lane next to the cars as long as it's somewhat protected. And I think it's important to have that protection or you won't see an increase in riders. I also, I just wanted to also highlight the fact that all the data that we have is from COVID era, really. And so it's really hard to estimate what use would be if, you know, it, when we return to normal. Um, and it's, it's really hard to tell what our true numbers would be, um, especially if we have those protected lanes. Because when we did have them before, we just didn't have that many people out on the roads. So, um, so I'd like to see an increase in cycling, and I think that a dedicated lane would support that. Thank you, Councilor Cook. Uh, Councilor Bagley. Um, thank you, Mayor. If, if you don't have any comments, I'd like to suspend the rules and bring forward item D under my name, uh, number one, Middle Street Bike Lanes for the sample motion. Um, happy to do that. I had one question for Ms. Finnegan uh, before uh, we broke, and I appreciate the uh, the work that you put in uh, to this, and it's a lot of work. And hopefully, this uh, work is not uh, stranded cost, as my good friend Peter would say. When we look at uh, the future of repaving uh, the streets, that some of this work can be dusted off and have a discussion. Uh, use some of the input that we had from residents on how do we. Uh, make Middle Street a better street uh, for both cars and bikes when we when we repave it. My only question uh, has to do with the um, putting in bike lanes uh, outside, just painted bike lanes. And we're not talking about putting protected bike lanes, but simply paint on the outside of that. And this is going into the wayback machine for myself um, <laughs> in terms of one of the uh, you know we had always or not always, but when this started, we looked at this as a temporary project that we would learn from because there were uh, aspects to the road were, that were not conducive. Not the road undulating itself, but simply like the crown of the road is not centered to where it would support a bike lane um, or the configuration. And some of the comments around whether a bike or some of the comments of where we'd repaint uh, the yellow lines in that did not meet the crown of the road, so cars felt somewhat unease and they couldn't explain why. That's but right. it was because the crown of the road was separate from the white or the yellow lines to accommodate the bike line. So I, I want to go forward with, and I would agree with Councilor Cook, the safest possible that we can do, but I don't want to get into a situation where we're, we're painting over uh, what the natural flow of traffic and and by doing so, build up maybe more resentment for what we would then try to accomplish in in the next year or two in terms of a you know a, a, a greater look at how do we incorporate bike lanes in there with paving the road. So, is it your professional opinion that the road as as marked now um, can accommodate bike lanes without altering the uh, the middle of the road or the, the as it aligns to the crown of the road. And that's much more a technical question than I have any business asking, but hopefully <laughs> you understand the, the, totally the understand. gist of this. Uh, I would say based on some of the conversations, and to just I'm going to make this one point. I, I didn't do this alone. Um, yeah. Peter, Eric, and, and Tyler Ofsel helped very much, as well as other staff members with the city. So I just want to make sure everybody's clear that it wasn't just me and, and my team. It was also the city who contributed a lot of time and effort into this project. Um, sorry, that was my. Now I will answer your question. Uh, um, I am not sure, to be honest. I know that Peter and I have had some conversation about what that is and that, it, that, that the double yellow is not on the crown of the road. And 
So what may be happening is because people are they're kind of riding on that side, people will probably be uncomfortable unless you move the center line to where the crown of the road is. However, that may negate having a, a, a proper, like a conventional bike lane for lack, or a buffered bike lane, for example, um, unless you want to remove the parking in that section. And I know that's not something people really want to be doing. It is my understanding, and if I'm wrong, just please let me know. Um, so you, if you've had a problem now, it's going to continue in terms of how the cars ride on the road until you fix the crown. Okay. Um, but I don't know how much of a problem it is because I didn't hear that was an issue until you just said that. So. It was something that I think that uh, it stuck in my mind over the many, many hours we had the conversation uh, around this in terms of if we were to – um, if we were to do it right, and I'm in the camp of, you know, let's, um, let's, you know, try to make this um, as good as it is right now before we invest actual dollars. But when we invest dollars, let's make, you know, let's try to take into account everything that we'd like to occur uh, on the road when we when we are actually putting shovels in the ground and, uh, and and can afford to change things that we simply can't afford to change right now before we pave the. And, and I think you should change that. Like, I mean, moving forward, and you do this project, like you, at some point in the future, and you and you change, you know, you deal with the asphalt and, and or adding a protective bike lane or those things. They're going to take those things into consideration when you can actually move. I, I have no. I mean, move curb line. Like, you know, if you move curb line out, you're going to have to change how the pavement works and your drainage works and all those other kinds of things. So, I think in the future, at some future project, that's definitely something that can happen. Right this minute, there's it, you. It's what it is out there, and it's the best that it can be at the moment, is my, my thought process. Moving forward, I think you have to move that. You're going to have to move where that crown line is and things like that. So thank you, I Ms. hope Nina. that answers your question. It does. Okay. All right. Uh, happy to uh, entertain a motion to suspend the rules and bring up, what was it, uh, uh, the item under your name? Item under my name, item one, Middle Street Bike Lanes. Uh, Motion. Do we suspend the rules? We've got to suspend the rules first to bring up item one under Councilor Bagley's uh, name. I uh, await a motion to do so. Your Honor, I move we suspend the rules to move to Councilor Bagley's item. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Councilor Bagley. Now I'll make a motion to approve the report recommendations with the Council. Um, I'm just going to go ahead and say to add striped bike lanes. Um, with the cars remaining on the curb. Second. Is any discussion? Councilor Moreau. I'm just curious. It sort of seems to be an either or in your motion. So which which option are we going with here? Oh, I think he picked uh, striped <laughs> unprotected bike lanes. I ad libbed based on the okay. previous conversations. <laughs> <laughs> yep, so I'll, to, I'll restate the motion uh, is move to approve report recommendations with the council uh, and implement striped unprotected bike lanes as the preferred alternative. Thank you. That yes, motion? that helps. Um, I'll just speak to that if I might. Yep. Um, I, the, the mayor brought up some excellent points and I, I think we had a, a great presentation. One of the things I've learned in parking traffic and safety is that especially with modern cars the way they are now. You know, they, they have a lot of power. They get up to speed. They're, you can feel very comfortable driving at a high rate of speed. And on middle road, that happens. So to me, uh, when I hear that, you know, people might feel a little bit uncomfortable driving down that road, I don't necessarily see that as a bad thing. Because if you feel a little bit uncomfortable, you're likely to be a little bit more observant and possibly slow down. Um, it, as some people may know, I live right behind Portsmouth Market. Um, parallel to middle road so that's the the route i use every day and the route my daughter uses every day um so obviously i have some bias in this but i think anything we can do to slow down traffic um i'm, I'm sorry i've been saying middle road when i mean middle street uh would be ideal and i don't necessarily think that if people feel a little bit uncomfortable that's a bad thing because it may uh, slow them down a little bit so uh, just to clar uh, clarify, my, um, my comment on the, the crown versus the, 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 the painted line of the road wasn't that uh, folks uh, necessarily felt uncomfortable in the moment, but they would notice that they would, they would, they would come out of the, the flow of traffic and then realize that because they were kind of just going with the, the center of the road and then overcorrect uh, at the end. Um, I would agree that when you make roads more narrow, you make people feel that they have to 
drive slower. My concern with uh, uh, with the way the lines are now is that people do not feel they feel very comfortable, uh, but their car is kind of to, to kind of bank in a certain way that is not uh, does not align with the, the painted uh, uh, yellow lines. So I guess the only qualification is that I would want to make sure that the yellow lines as they are as they are presented uh, are they are they currently on the crown of the road or are they on the, are they outside of the crown of the road and if we put them on the crown of the road would we be able to have the unprotected bike lanes outside of the cars uh, they're currently when they put the bike lanes in they shifted the center line off of the crown of the roadway um, the alignment is necessary to, to give you the parking plus a, a bike lane so by sliding it back you would you know likely lose that bike lane uh, for sections of it or lose parking for sections of it um, it also would require grinding off another section of paint which would then reflect uh, because of the, the markings and the, the, the etching in the pavement um, or you would paint it over with black paint which then makes it a little confusing so one I would suggest um, you know, as Councillor Cook and, and you pointed out, um, uh, Mr. Mayor, that a comprehensive reworking of that roadway, the cross section of the roadway, so that the center, the crown of the roadway matches the center line, and that we make it um, a safer roadway as possible when we do a, a major construction is what I would recommend. At this point, um, the way the center line is, by putting a bike lane in, you are going to better define that, that roadway. So even though somebody would feel as if they, they're getting tugged a little bit, they're going to have the definition of that bicycle lane to give them you know, a perspective on where they should be driving. Um, so at this point, I mean, if the direction of the council is to slide it back that way, you know, we'd look at the configuration, you'd likely lose that um, the space for it, and so then you would push yourself into a Shero type position, um, so you'd have a share, uh, the share the road type of situation instead of a designated bike lane. Um, given the speeds on that section of roadway, I think it's on the upper end of what I would deem as acceptable. As Councillor Cook said, you know, you really can't get the speed up. I'm an avid cyclist. I ride at a pretty decent clip, and I would not consider myself a Cheryl rider in that condition. Daniel Street, well, Congress Josh Street. Is pretty quick. <laughs> yes, I know. I, I, he's, he's a little younger than I am, so. Uh, so I, I would, I would, you know, if, if you do, if the decision is to readjust that center line, it becomes a bit of a bigger project uh, and I think it would add to confusion relative to the uh, markings on the roadway so okay. I would not recommend it at this time so but you would recommend and 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 uh, both you and Miss Finnegan would recommend that a uh, using a, def uh, a bike lane to define the travel area will not it's not your expectation that it will cause confusion so long as the cars are on the side of the road and the bike lane is not protected at this moment I cannot speak for every person uh, I would appreciate you know as a driver I would like to see that I think it would better define it I know some people would um, not be happy with it just because it's different um, but it is something that it'll it'll be effective in terms of defining the roadway uh, the travel lane uh, and make it clear that that's a, a bicycle lane thank you uh, count or the assistant mayor just a, um, a question for clarification um, on the motion when we say striped lanes is are we um, is there a difference that we're outlining between regular striped bike lanes and buffered bike lanes with stripes in them that's an excellent question I would leave that up to the discretion of and if, uh, the director of public works and just roll another so if we need to change the motion we should yeah, yeah before we will have Peter come up and then So the subtle difference is that you would have an additional line with, with, with hash marks on it that kind of give you the feeling that there's a, a separation between the roadway and the, and the, the bike lane. Okay. Um, it's, visually, I think it's a, it's a better treatment uh, for the bike lane. Um, and it, it, gives, it still gives you the decent space that if a car door is coming off, you have the ability to swing over and not be getting into the travel lane. So I mean, that is something that we could do. Thank you. Assistant Mayor. I would move then to make the friendly amendment to move that to buffered bike lanes. Accepted, if possible. Yeah. Second. 
and accepted. Okay. Any other discussion? Just a, another question uh, for Councillor Bagley on this. Um, what was the discussion uh, at PTS, and is there a reason why there wasn't a recommendation over uh, Cheros versus uh, buffered bike lanes? Yeah. So um, during the PTS meeting, I was I was attending remotely on Zoom. Uh, so there's some discussion about bike lanes and kind of that it's a bit of a political hot potato. So I don't think anybody wanted to. Um, take too strong a stand one way or the other. So the decision at PTS was to accept the recommendations as presented. Um, I did ask the question then if bike lanes would be a preferred alternative, but I didn't feel it was the appropriate um, medium for me to explain all the reasonings why in PTS. Okay, and just in the presentation, um, did we, uh, the recommendation was Sharos? That's correct. And when did the option of a uh, buffered uh, unprotected bike lane uh, enter the conversation? Uh, I was the last person to ask a question during the meeting, and that question I asked was, would Sharos be an acceptable alternative? No, sorry, would oh. bike lanes be a perfect? Uh, I'm sorry, yes, would uh, bike lanes be an acceptable alternative to Sharos? Okay. No. Councilor Tabor. Um, I intend to vote for this motion, um, but I just wanted to ask if I could, we could have a little time after the vote to talk about the next step, which would be the uh, when we redo the whole street. Um, certainly, but um, yep. Okay. Well, it's not on the, uh, I guess it's not on the agenda. So why don't we bring that forth as an agenda item if we want to talk about that. I'm sure there'd be more people that want to talk about, you know, what uh, is, uh, is there if it's a, uh, or we could hit on it in miscellaneous that you'd want to report back on, uh, on, okay. on that. Okay. I guess I, I have some reservations on the buffered bike lane. Um, it seems as though I, uh, from a safety perspective, it's, um, it could be more safe. I, uh, I don't know if it's going to meet the standard of, of Councillor Cook or her daughter uh, <clears throat> riding on there. Um, I, I don't think that I would have uh, my five and a half year old learn how to you know, bike on Middle Street more broadly um, with the bike lanes, with the protected bike lanes, but um, I do have uh, some concern that we would be um, taking away from the conversation that we'd be having in 2023 uh, and beyond around you know, what it is we're going to be doing, and um, so I'm, I'm, I'm conflicted uh, on this. Um, I guess um, one question for Ms. Finnegan: um, Why was this? Why was this design? I guess I I get a little antsy when design alternatives uh, are asked for and created in a. Um, since this wasn't in the report to go outside of Sharos or to do Sharos, um, why uh, can you go over again why a buffered bike lane was not a part of your recommendation? What is uh, so? If we start at the not the beginning, but when the when the paver markings went away, you were left with a really wide lane that had parking on the curb. And so when I took a look at that, I said it's been working well for six months. How do we make this the way it's set up and people are used to it now? work better in terms of defining things more appropriately. So at that point, bikes and cars were sharing that wide lane and there was parking on the side. So my, I said, that's, that's what I think we should do because it's the, to me it was a, a good way to define what needed to occur and gave people kind of the, you know, you look at the ground, oh, something's going on. And that is why I picked that. It doesn't mean that, you know, a bike lane or a buffered bike lane isn't in it is a is those are also good alternatives but what i was trying to do was minimize the amount of change and use the tools we had to better define it that is why i picked sharrows because it met the criteria but also left it similar to what it is with some minor changes to let people know that there's bikes there you need to pay attention those kinds of things that's why okay and one last question 
uh, Sharos, we, if we did not do buffered bike lanes or non-buffered bike lanes, or paint, I'm just going to call them painted bike lanes. Fair enough. Um, if we if we didn't do painted bike lanes, we would have to do Sharos, correct, in terms of a, a recommendation. I guess I have feelings that Sharos are kind of invisible, um, but maybe not for Councillor Denton because he's going so fast. But uh, <laughs> it seemed, but we would have to put those in there. Sheriffs would have to be there uh, in order to keep the, the funding because there's some uh, federal law around that. Yes, okay. there's federal requirements around okay. around right. those kinds of things. So, right. and yeah, so anything else? That's it. All right. I made my decision. All right. Well, I have a roll call vote. Assistant Mayor Kelly? Yes. Councillor Tabor? Yes. Councillor Denton? Yes. Councillor Moreau? Yes. Councillor Bagley? Yes. Councillor Lombardi? Yes. Councillor Blaylock? Yes. Councillor Cook? Yes. Mayor McEachern? Yes. Unanimous. Next <coughs> up is not Councillor Bagley, although we might come back to him. <laughs> oh, don't, give away, don't steal my thunder. <laughs> the presentation regarding the neighborhood parking program. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, Kevin, if you don't mind promoting Ben Fletcher to panelist mode, and I will bring up his presentation. Welcome, Ben. Ben, you can unmute yourself and get going. Thanks. Thought I was unmuted. That was the first thing I thought I touched. All right, can everybody hear me okay? We can. 98. Okay, excellent. Thank you very much. Uh, so welcome everybody. The, the, uh, the City of Portsmouth Parking Division thanks you all for the opportunity to discuss the Islington Creek Neighborhood Parking Program pilot launched on August 4th, 2021. We've presented some mid-pilot updates at multiple PTS meetings. Tonight's presentation intends to discuss the life of the program from its uh, concept stage through April 30th, 2022, including relevant statistics and costs to date. So uh, factors of success, aside from anecdotal data, there are two primary indicators as to whether the Islington Creek NPP has had the intended effect of reducing demand measured by parking occupancy percentages in the target neighborhood, which in layman's terms manifests itself as additional parking space when I want it. Uh, the the um, to the consumer as it were so the the first measure consists of determining whether or not demand figures are indeed reduced as a direct result of the program uh, given positive evidence to the first second measure is an indication of where the displaced demand ie now ineligible vehicle users chose then to engage in parking so this is measured by looking at demand in the immediately adjacent Parking alternatives, again, measured by parking uh, occupancy percentages in those areas, whether they're monetized or not. So this evening's presentation seeks to clarify any shifts or changes in demand in both the NPP designated area and the surrounding immediate parking alternatives. So as you see on this tile here, a little bit of history. The Islington Creek neighborhood requested that the city create a pilot program in 2019 to address its parking concerns. Uh, the 2019 version of NPP did not achieve its 75% vote threshold uh, that was placed on it. Uh, the neighborhood then renewed its request in 2020, but the consideration was delayed by COVID-19 in 2021. Uh, public meetings were held on April 14 and June 10, where the current version of the program was developed. Uh, next tile, please. So the boundaries are set as Islington, Dover Bridge, and McDonough Streets, uh, and, and uh, Hanover as it goes further east. Uh, three permits plus one guest permit per NPP household or business, and one permit was allowable for any Portsmouth resident outside of the neighborhood. Uh, Non-participants are limited to two hours free parking and enforcement hours being from 9 a.m. to 7 p.m., uh, excuse me, 8 p.m., uh, Monday through Sunday. The, uh, the Islington Street uh, shown here in the map in orange is to indicate that residents on Islington might participate if they'd like to, but that Islington Street itself was not part of the NPP map because it is already governed with a two hour limit to support business. Um, so as expected, the NPP program has seen strong participation. Again, the current iteration of the program allows us for up to three permits per household. 
uh, where each must be attributable to a particular vehicle and one transferable gas permit. Additionally, residents outside uh, of other areas in Portsmouth are eligible for one permit, which must also be attributable to a particular vehicle. So since the launch of the program on August 4, 2021, the program has seen 430 regular passes issued, 377 within the neighborhood, and 53 from elsewhere in Portsmouth. Additionally, there are 220 guest permits in circulation, which totals 650 overall passes. So this equates to 259% of the overall 251 space inventory that available to the neighborhood. So the neighborhood itself without outside influence is upside down with regard to demand versus supply. Uh, so of all the issues brought forward this, uh, since this discussion began in earnest uh, in 2017, the most common was the belief that it was employees of downtown businesses that were creating issues by parking in the neighborhood and walking into town to work their shifts. In 2017, I personally observed this to be the case. It, it was accurate. So, But since that time, consistent with the 2012 parking principles, available public inventory was increased when the construction of the foundry was completed in October 2018 by 600 spaces. And subsequently, the downtown employee parking program was introduced, providing for a 70% reduction off the $1 per hour foundry rate for employees of downtown Portsmouth businesses. As we came out of COVID in 2021, a more positive outlook had businesses reopening for that 2021 tourism season, uh, which made for a more normal hiring season uh, that year. So between the spring of 2021 and August 3rd, the day before the program launched, the downtown employee program, it was proud to see a 202% uh, increase in participation. So the graph of in front of you now seems to show, uh, uh, seeks to show the relationship between increased sales in the downtown employee program, particularly in the spring and summer of 2021, and any related reduction in occupancy percentages in the NPP target neighborhood. One citizen opined that employees may have jumped into the program in anticipation of the launch of the NPP, where you would expect a likewise reduction and occupancy percentages seen in the target neighborhood during that time. In other words, if the new participants in the downtown employee program had previously been utilizing the NPP neighborhood for their parking needs, we should have seen a drop in neighborhood occupancy rates as participation in the employee program increased. However, the neighborhood occupancy rates do not reflect this trend remaining in the 60 to low 70% range shown in the red square at the top of the graph. It's also important to note that the increased employee participation did coincide with a normal increase in hiring uh, historically seen at the inception of the annual tourism season. And finally, with the seasonal drop uh, in participation in the downtown employee program shown in blue to the right of the previous graph, we have not seen, there we go, we have not seen higher occupancies return to the target neighborhood. All of this suggests that the downtown workforce was no longer a primary influence on availability of parking inventory in the target neighborhood prior to the launch of the pilot, nor does it seem to be now. Outside of downtown workers, it's possible that shoppers and out of town visitors might also be engaged in using the NPP out of habit. If it bears true that downtown shoppers and visitors are using the neighborhood for parking, and a program like NPP is launched to discourage this practice, another metric to consider would be any increased use of neighborhood adjacent parking alternatives. The next two graphs highlight pre and post launch occupancies of both the bridge lot and the foundry garage. So interestingly, the bridge lot transaction and peak occupancy figures held steady after the NPP pilot launched. Uh, then seeing the typical shoulder season drop off in demand in October, which mirrors what we see uh, in the NPP neighborhood and throughout town uh, in terms of occupancy rates and demand. Next tile, please. Meanwhile, the Foundry Garage peak occupancies also held steady on post launch, remaining at 41%, even as the downtown employee program continued to enjoy strong participation throughout the summer. 
Additionally, Foundry has not seen the same shoulder season drop off in occupancy we've experienced in the NPP pilot area and the bridge lot and throughout Portsmouth. This data, coupled with an average length of stay at Foundry of 8.43 hours, suggests that the downtown workforce demographic is making use of the Foundry garage in large numbers. It's also noteworthy that we have not experienced increased usage at the Masonic lot located at the intersection of Middle and Miller, which is leased by the city to provide for additional inventory, nor have I been made aware that the division is receiving calls or complaints about rising occupancy rates in neighborhoods immediately adjacent to Islington Creek. So the division has been keeping regular morning, e noon and evening counts of occupancy in the target neighborhood throughout the process. So throughout the summer of 2020, spring of 2021, and pre-launch of summer 2021, those figures were consistently average in the 60s to low 70s percentage wise. Typically in the parking industry, occupancy rates of 85% or higher are where we begin to develop strategies to mitigate demand. Next tile, please. This tile represents data from the first three months of the program before the shoulder season began, where we looked at occupancy figures as they compared to previously recorded time periods to get an understanding of any changes to occupancy that could be directly attributable to the program. Comparing post-launch August against summer 2021, the neighborhood saw a 0.84% reduction in occupancy, equating to 2.11 spaces of inventory gained, which would be represented as space now available that would have been filled previously. As the program settled in, September showed an additional 2.32% reduction when compared to August equating to another 5.83 spaces gained. October versus September showed another 1.979, excuse me, percent reduction, equating to another 4.48 spaces. So through the first three months of the program, prior to the start of the tourism shoulder season in 2021, where we would typically see reductions in demand citywide, the neighborhood did enjoy a 4.95% reduction in occupancy, equivalent to 12.42 spaces gained. That could be directly attributed to the pilot. It's prudent to note, though, that the majority of these spaces were gained at the west end of the neighborhood, where streets on the east end remained very tight, but now had populations of vehicles that had NBP credentials on them. Next tile, please. So this tile graphically displays pre and post launch occupancy percentages just discussed. The biggest takeaway is we'd not see a precipitous drop in occupancy percentage post launch. As with all programs of this type, the largest impacts are generally seen early on as the execution of the enforcement process encourages eligible users to do the legwork to participate and those not eligible are encouraged to seek alternatives. So while we do see a fairly significant drop starting in late October and into the winter months, this is consistent with historic demand figures recorded in this neighborhood over the last several years. Next tile, please. Through April 30th, a total of 526 citations have been issued, including 45 warning tickets early on and 481 two-hour violations. Collections total $5,725 since the program's inception, so uh, it's pretty clear that collections from citation issuance are not anticipated to be a major factor should the program proceed forward. Next tile, please. So this tile basically summarizes everything, 259% issuance of passes versus spaces available with a program that allows for three plus one per household. This is indicative of an inherent demand versus supply issue in the residential population before considering outside user influence. The city increased its park and inventory by 600 spaces with the construction of the foundry garage and offers greatly discounted parking to the city's downtown workforce demographic at that location. Prior to the pilot launch, the program saw a 202% increase during 2021 to summer tourism hiring ramp up. The division is very pleased again to report that the program recently saw its highest sales figures to date during the month of April 2022, which marks the start of this year's summer tourism hiring season. With an average length of stay of 8.43 hours at the foundry, the division asserts the program has demonstrated itself to be a viable solution for downtown Portsmouth workforce that might otherwise you choose to utilize local neighborhoods for parking needs. 
So the rest of this tile rounds out at 4.95% uh, gained inventory for the first three months, which is 12.42 spaces. Uh, no uh, change in foundry occupancy or bridge lot occupancy and no indication of increased demand in Masonic or uh, surrounding residential neighborhoods. At $5,700 in citation collections uh, uh, so far uh, and $91,650 in associated costs. Next tile, please. As mentioned, the total costs associated with the program uh, through April 30th are 916540 49 uh, this includes roughly 4750 in startup costs for items such as signage and signage supplies and installation. Uh, roughly $1,900 in additional early costs include uniform citation supplies and office supplies. While all of those items have a shelf life, uh, they don't represent costs we see every month, rather once or twice a year. Uh, the remainder of the costs are operational, however, and do recur at an average of at presently 94.4703 each month of the program. So while well, eventually it was decided that the pilot program would carry no fee for participation, a subject of great debate prior to the pilot's approval centered around what the cost of an NPP parking pass might be if the program were moved forward permanently. Uh, next tile, please. Using the current figures and projecting the average <coughs> excuse me, monthly cost going forward, each year of the NPP is estimated to cost the city roughly 120,000. Citations are estimated to bring in roughly 6,000, so this equates to 114,000 in anticipated net costs annualized. There are presently 650 passes at the current price point at zero. Dividing the projected cost of 120,000 by 650 renders an annual break-even figure of $176 per pass per year. Uh, just as by, by way of uh, supposition, if a 15% reduction in participation could be assumed as a result of the city moving beyond the price point of zero, that calculation would equate to 553 passes remaining in the program, which would suggest an annual price point of $207, which uh, would break even the program for the year. Next tile, please. So throughout the process, the division has championships, uh, public feedback uh, through survey data, a, a link on the Parkport website that uh, provides a venue for thoughts on the program. I'll refrain from reading through each of these next two tiles uh, one by one, but they do represent a general sampling of what is roughly split down the middle in terms of positive versus negative feedback and opinion. I can add that my staff reports to me that anecdotally at least, the commentary offered in person is generally not in favor. So at this point, I am happy to take any questions you, you might have. Thank you, Mr. Fletcher. Any questions? Uh, Councilor Denton and Councilor Tabor, uh, Councilor Bagley and Councilor Cook. Thank you, Your Honor. Ben, one of the things in public feedback said it was hard for renters. So I'm curious how a renter applied for the program versus the building or property owner. So I, I think maybe that comment was taken early on where, you know, we had a building or, or maybe two that had multiple, multiple uh, um, renters in the same building as opposed because there was a, there was a, initially a limit to three permits per household well what becomes a household what becomes a rental property and so on and so on uh, to answer your question quickly the, the the procedure was the same um the person would have to come down and prove that they were a resident of that area and and, and in their case uh generally a, a a fully executed lease would be a part of that process along with identification and other things. So uh, I'm not certain that, that that comment still applies. You you would have to, I have not heard it recently. That was a, a very uh, early on comment. I think we've addressed the issue there. Uh, Councilor Tabor. Uh, thank you, Your Honor. Ben, did we ask an overall um, uh, approve or disapprove question in the survey. I, I recall we 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 did ask that. No, it was more nuanced to you know what do you like about the program, what don't you like about the program. It, the idea, I guess, was to give um, uh, people an open forum so where they weren't kind of uh, I guess you know 
selecting you know answers that were predetermined for them. Uh, I know some of that opinion exists that some of the answers were predetermined. I think we addressed one question early on where somebody couldn't check off a certain box because it didn't exist and we added that box or what have you. But uh, the, the long term <coughs> answer, while more difficult to categorize on a one off and one basis, a one by one basis, uh, it does provide people a, a, a venue to, to speak their mind, so to speak, as opposed to, you know, punching a yes or no button or a, a percentage button or something like that. Thanks. So I think that's what was behind uh, the idea there. Uh, Councillor Bagley, then Councillor Cook. Uh, thank you, Your Honor. Thank you, Director Fletcher, for the presentation. Uh, question, sure. if we ended up with the neighborhood parking pass of around $200, let's say, just looking at the data that you have, do you have uh, data on other municipalities in the area that might have a neighborhood parking program and roughly how much they might charge uh, either on a sure. per month or yearly basis? So, uh, I'm sorry, go ahead and finish, please. Oh, on a, a yearly or, per, or monthly basis. Right. So I spoke with Bill Simons up in Dover. Uh, you know, we, we speak frequently on a number of items that cross uh, that are across cities. Uh, he's got a number of programs that he that they've been running neighborhood by neighborhood. So street by street, even in some cases, half a street, halfway up the street, only on the right side, that kind of thing. Uh, and in a lot of cases, they've monetized the area to try and mitigate uh, the demand, uh, as they as they did in an earlier example I gave a year or so ago. But to, sh to quickly answer your question, they are they're, they're in the in the process of phasing out a lot of these programs. But his new pricing this coming year is is looking to be thirty five dollars a month, which is roughly uh, four hundred twenty dollars a year for for a permit to park on particular streets, whatever neighborhood they might be in. Thank you. Councilor Cook. Sir. Thank you, Mayor, and thank you, Ben, so much for your presentation. Um, I, I had a few questions about, you said that it didn't, as far as we could tell, we didn't displace um, parking to other neighborhoods. Um, do you know, did you look at um, Hancock Street and Gates Street in the south end to see if there was increased parking in those areas? And I know this is a tough question to answer because uh, during COVID anyway, there's reduced need for parking because there were sure. reduced numbers. But Well, I would suggest that Hancock and those streets are pretty far away uh, from this particular target neighborhood. So I wouldn't suggest that anybody that would be uh, going to visit somebody on, on Cabot north of uh, Islington or McDonough Street would be parking in that area and walking across town to visit the area, you'd, I would suggest you'd see more uh, an indication of swelling of population south of Islington, you know, uh, in, in any of those number of streets along the border, but we have not seen that to be the case. Can I follow up? Follow up. Um, thank you. Um, and the, I should say the reason I ask is because we see people parking on Gate Street in the south end and walking all the way to downtown <coughs> for work um, because it's free parking. So, um, so that's why I ask. It's they'll, they're willing to walk a long ways for free parking. Um, but my other question, I guess, is: Had you ever looked at dividing this neighbor up, neighborhood up, like um, you just said was kind of done in Dover, street by street basis, and looking at a more limited program just on the like say the first few blocks that are closest to downtown, first four blocks, and also adding some of the other neighborhood streets that are closest to downtown, not necessarily full neighborhoods, but individual street by street basis um, to reduce parking on immediate streets around the downtown? So there's two things, two answers to that, parts of that answer. One is uh, anytime you do a single street or a couple of streets, you have to consider what the impact will be on the surrounding streets, which makes them become NPP streets because now they're overcrowded with cars that are no longer able to park where they normally would on, on the streets in question. So uh, the NPP program has been a neighborhood initiative from day one. It's not a city staff initiative. So we've let the neighborhood drive what they want to see and how they want to be governed. And we started that process in 2018 with a survey, an online survey that asked a number of questions that were garnered from you know national surveys, uh, other cities I spoke with, my visit to Baltimore and all the time they graciously spent with me about their extensive set of programs. And um, the 
the the size of the neighborhood went back and forth and back and forth and back and forth until it became what it is now. Uh, the the issue I would have, or I would at least point out, that might occur if um, if you say it said everything from Rock Street East was part of this neighborhood situation, and then everything west of that wasn't. You start seeing, you know, uh, an influx of parking on the, the immediate streets to the west of Rock Street, which would uh, then initiate a call for inclusion of, in the neighborhood uh, of those streets so that they could be part of it and push the parking further out and so on and so on, which is how we ended up at the size of the neighborhood we have now. Uh, the, the divisional will enforce whatever the council decides in its infinite wisdom that it's a good idea to do here. Um, I'm, I'm happy to provide the, the data, anecdotal and otherwise, the data from people uh, that are experiencing the program, uh, positive and negative. Uh, I'm not in a position to levy an opinion on this uh, because it is a, it's, it's precarious when a city official levies an opinion on a, on a public policy. The, uh, the, the, what we've done is in the past is just to, to allow the neighborhood to tell us what they'd like to see happen execute that and, and this is the results of that current ver version of the program. Um, I'm happy to get professional uh, advice or, or what I think is going to happen if we do uh, like a minimal type of situation as you suggested like, and I just have that I think you're going to see spill over into uh, surrounding streets that will then call for inclusion in the program which is how we got to the size of the map as it stands. Thank you. Councilor Moreau. Um, as probably most of the people here know, I've been living in this specific neighborhood for the last 20 years, so I've had a lot of experience parking in our previous house to the one we lived in now. We did not have enough off-street parking for where, um, at the house we lived in. I have noticed a huge difference since this parking program was put in place, and I know it seems like we didn't gain a lot of extra parking. But I think what you're finding is now that the people that live there get to park in there more. So it's some of it, I think, is a one-to-one -one swap that isn't really being able to show in the numbers. Um, I also believe that it has made it a neighborhood that now people don't circle looking for parking. So it's made it safer because people aren't speeding down the street nearly as much as they once did. Um, circling, I mean, I, you could watch the same car without a state plates go past your house several times trying to figure out where they could park. So this has really directed people to, you know, park in the public places that they're supposed to park. Um, I understand there's a cost to it, but at the same time, I do think um, that most of the residents might be willing to pay something for a um, parking permit. I just don't know if they are going to be willing to pay sort of the full amount, but I certainly support uh, this project moving forward and uh, maybe we could look at hours of enforcement. Maybe we could look at how often enforcement happens. I think there's ways that we could probably reduce the cost and I don't know um, Ben if you actually had taken a look at any of the uh, any options if we either reduced hours or reduced how often enforcement or maybe we have different hours in different parts of the neighborhood, right? If you're farther out from downtown, you might have shorter hours versus being slightly closer to downtown. I think there's some options to be explored and I would really like to see us dig into those explorations uh, before we just get rid of the program altogether. Thank you. Well, Councilman. we're happy to execute whatever is, is put before us. The um, the hours are set forth, you know, by the citizens who uh, designed the program in, in, in mass, and, and what I thought was a pretty good collaborative effort there. Um, the, the the issue of uh, frequency of enforcement: if you have a two-hour limit, if you don't enforce every two hours, you're not going to get much done. So we, we don't have a choice there. If we're going to have a two-hour limit, we've got to run through whatever the size of the neighborhood uh, in a span of two hours, so that we can check the cars once again on the next run through. Now. Uh, enforcing uh, later hours in the, in the, in the uh, streets further west, you know, eventually that will get learned, uh, but it, it will probably have a positive early impact, um, you know, as would just leaving the signs up and, and not doing the program at all. The signage alone would take a lot of Massachusetts folks that aren't aware that the program is or isn't being enforced, you know, out of the mix. But I wouldn't suggest that leaving just signage up that's toothless would, would do much good beyond a few short days anyway. So 
Um, we're, we're happy to address this in any way, and, I'm, and I'll give you my thoughts on what I think, um, you know, uh, certain time slots might or might not do. I mean, shoot, if you're, if you're down there by Dover Street, it seems like the evening hours would be more, uh, you know, apropos because you've got the liar's bench down there. So, I mean, uh, the, again, this was done as a, a block neighborhood. This is, this is the, was the, the area that was designated as, as what we wanted to, to do this with. And, and this is the data that's presented by this particular footprint and this particular time frame. So, uh, uh, but I'm, we're happy to, you know, address and I'm, and I'm happy to give advice on anything you think uh, you might see as positive. Uh, Councilor Bagley. Um, thank you, Your Honor. If, if I may, it may inform the discussion if we ask uh, Director Fletcher to stay on and suspend the rules and move up an item. Uh, sure. Um, I just have one question for Councilor Fletcher. If we're done with uh, this part of the uh, question and answer, I understand you'll pull up a motion. Um, uh, Mr. Fletcher, I guess I, I had a couple of uh, questions. Is there data uh, from an occupant standpoint, occupancy standpoint, um, in the in on a street by street or or uh, broken out smaller than uh, the uh, I guess the the larger neighborhood or is the larger neighborhood the only uh, numbers that we have? Does that question Absolutely. make sense? Absolutely, we have street by street data, morning, noon, and night. <laughs> <clears throat> so uh, what I can tell you anecdotally and pretty quickly to the point, you know, the easternmost streets are showing full and the mid streets are showing medium full and the western streets are showing less full, uh, as you might expect being closer to downtown. Also, it's more heavily populated per space available in the east end. So if you think about, say, uh, you know, Tanner Court has three spaces and there's, there's got to be half a dozen, two dozen apartments down there you know, uh, between Hill and Hanover there that all buy for that space. So um, the, the creation of inventory is the hardest thing you can do. And, you know, the city built the boundary garage a block away, or less than a block away from that exact spot. So there, there is places for folks to go. Yes, it does cost money. So uh, it may be interesting to find out uh, whatever, if there's a price point that gets picked or chosen upon for uh, a, a monthly or yearly cost of a pass, if that's, if it's less expensive to park in the foundry, then that's where you'll see the traffic go. So uh, that would be you know, one way to look at things. Okay, and then just a just a follow-up question to maybe the conversation that uh, Councillor Barrow had on the ongoing costs associated with the the program. Um, is there, and this is a, this is a question on from a uh, from your professional. Um, experience uh, is there a uh, like a startup learning curve where people learn that it's enforced and then you can reduce the enforcement if you randomize where it's being enforced or do people catch on immediately to uh, it not being uh, enforced on the two-hour limit does that question make sense? And that's a professional. Yeah, it, it does. And, and the honest answer is they catch on pretty darn fast. And the word of mouth travels amazingly fast, especially in a small town. So you can do that. But if, you, if you're going to have a two-hour limit, if you're not enforcing on two hours, then you open up a whole can of worms as to whether or not a citation is legitimate and this and that and all kinds of things. So uh, the, one of the few things I would hold very fast to is if we have a two-hour limit, we need to be running through there every two hours. Okay. And then I guess the, the, the last question um, I have is in regards to Councillor Cooks. Um, you made the point that uh, we, didn't see, uh, we didn't see the spillover to, um, to, to other streets. Um, but uh, if, if word of mouth is, as, as you say, and, and people know, okay, maybe this neighborhood is, is no longer the neighborhood to even look around in here, um, do we have, uh, did we, we didn't track the data for any other, um, we didn't track the data for any other, uh, I, I guess, neighborhood, but if proximity to the downtown is what people are looking for, would it stand to reason that other uh, neighborhoods that are closer to the downtown but on the opposite side of town 
could see uh, an increase of, of traffic or parking rather. It, it's it's possible. So when uh, you know, for example, when we closed the bridge lot for the pop up, uh, that traffic did not spill into the neighborhood. It spilled into other paid parking at the foundry and other areas. Uh, so if somebody looking for for uh, cheaper free parking is not it's not probably you know unless dri unless driven in that direction for convenience or other word, uh, other sake. Uh, to go to the foundry, you would think that they would head south of Islington and into those neighborhoods. So, no, we did not perform, I don't have the manpower to perform yeah. counts in all of those areas three times a day at the same time I'm doing the others, but I would, I, I would rely on uh, a, a fairly vocal constituency to have spoken up at this point and saying, hey, we're seeing a lot of cars in our neighborhood, can you do something about this? So I, I would I would have anticipated if a large exodus had occurred, uh, which we did not see uh, from the NPP neighborhood upon you know enforcement of the program uh, in the first several months, then you you would have seen uh, that those neighborhoods say, hey, you know something's going on over here. I can't get a space anymore. This isn't the same neighborhood. A lot of a lot of other uh, uh, constituents would have, uh, in in my opinion, spoken up, and so. That didn't occur, and we also have some uh, some data from the uh, the, the lot at uh, Miller and Middle at uh, the uh, the Masonic lot, and did not see increased uh, demand or use, uh, usership there. So, and that's a free lot as well. So it, it's just interesting that we did not see a reduction in traffic, nor did we see an increase in traffic in the surrounding neighborhoods, which suggests that the traffic that's using the neighborhood is the traffic that belongs in the neighborhood and not necessarily outside influence from workers any longer or, uh, or, or people coming in from Boston and visiting and parking there and, and going in for a day of, of uh, enjoying the town. So uh, it's uh, some of that's anecdotal, much of it is, 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 is pure data, um, but the, uh, you know, everything seems to point to the fact that we did not chase a whole heck of a lot of folks out of the neighborhood as, uh, as I anticipated seeing, we just didn't see it. Okay, thank you, Ben. All right, uh, we'll need a motion to pull up Councillor uh, Bagley's uh, item under Neighborhood Parking Program. Uh, is that what we're pulling up? I can make a motion to suspend the rules. Yeah, yeah, let's motion that. Yeah. Second. To pull up, which one is it? Um, item two, item, sub-item two. Okay, two with sub-item two, okay. We need a vote on the suspending yeah. the rules. Do we have a second? Yeah. Okay. Uh, all in favor? Aye. Aye. And I'll make a motion, and then if I get a second, I'll speak to it. And I motion that we continue the neighborhood parking program pilot until uh, the conclusion of Labor Day weekend as uh, it is currently <coughs> configured. Second. Uh, so I think there's, uh, I hear a lot about the neighborhood parking program. Um, certainly from, from friends I have that live in the neighborhood, and uh, people are very passionate one way or the other. It, it seems more people prefer it than don't, um, but right now the program is free, so when we start charging for passes, if we do in fact start charging for passes, it's hard to say, will it be 50-50 or will it remain around 60-40? Uh, we don't know. But the, the bigger challenge that I'm concerned with is because of the pandemic, um, because of the Bridge Street lot paving, um, we just don't have enough data yet to make a firm conclusion. Uh, as a as a numbers person, when I look at the data, it, it's hard for me to support a neighborhood parking program that's gonna cost the city roughly $10,000 per space when our downtown A zone parking is only worth $6,500 per space. But as a, a neighbor, um, I understand the, the concerns that the people in the neighborhood have and, and their desire to have a neighborhood parking program. So I think it would be incumbent upon uh, for us as a council to give uh, what should be record numbers and why uh, there aren't the new buildings like the stadium micro apartments built yet we have lost uh, 300 spaces in the high Hanover garage so it should be as uh, there should be as much pressure as there ever is going to be uh, in the foreseeable future on this neighborhood over the course of the summer so I think if we uh, continue the program till the conclusion of Labor Day, we'll have some really good data to make a decision on in the fall. 
Any other questions or comments, Councillor Tabor? Yeah, Your Honor, I, I, what I'm hearing from our parking division is there's some relief. People are anecdotally feeling some relief. And but what is the cause of that relief? Is it the NPP, or is it the Foundry Employee Program, or is it perhaps that Heinemann, you know, is no longer employing people right in that neighborhood? So if we don't fully know what what is happening, what the cause of people, f like Councilor Moreau, honestly saying this is a better parking situation, I I. I I like the idea of let's get some more data through the summer and, and see if we can more precisely determine if the NPP is producing all the benefits. Councillor Cook, then Councillor Blaylock. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, I was hoping to get a clarification from the city on um, cost and whether or not we have this in the budget to continue the pilot for three more months. Ben, do you want to speak to that? I do not believe we have budgeted for this. I, I think we have, uh, gosh, you cut me off guard with that one. Uh, I think we have 100000 set aside in, um, in uh, uh, contingency for this. Uh, I hope if Director Rice is there, he can certainly opine us to that. Or if you give me a moment, I'll call up the budget real quick and look at it. But I don't think it's unfunded. Can we circle back to that question yes. and then Councilor Blair? Certainly, I, I, I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm pulling it up now so okay. we can circle back and I'll, I'll look for it as we hear the additional questions. Thank Sorry for not having that answer. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, that's also a concern of mine as well. Um, in hearing from Councilor Moreau, who actually lives in this neighborhood, I can't think of a better uh, person there. to give us an honest opinion, the first first-hand view um, I'm sure she's friendly with her neighbors. I'm sure she talks to her neighbors. Um, and I do understand seeing the numbers here from the parking department, but like Council Moreau said, maybe we are doing a one-for-one one here and it's not showing up on these graphs, on these numbers. Um, I do understand the cost as well, and that is important. So, um, But I do think it might be a good idea to look at this for a little bit longer. It, it is in the 23 budget. In contingency, it is $100,000. My apologies. Thanks, Ben. Thank you, yes, Mr. Fletcher. Uh, any other questions? I guess I had one. Um, I'm I'm interested to see, you know, what the, you know, a whole calendar year uh, would show us on this in the summer, uh, included in the summer. Um, but I feel as though we're not going to get uh, the data, at least one big kind of elephant-looking piece of data that. Uh, we won't know unless we actually do charge uh, for it, like how many people are going to pay uh, for this. Um, I think that has to influence our decision uh, somewhat. So I'd be curious um, to figure out a way that in the, the following six months, if the last three months could be a monthly charge at the rate that we set or something along the lines of what it would cost, because I think we're of the mind that, or at least I am of the mind that, uh, this would be a, a charge back uh, for the enforcement of this from a neighborhood standpoint uh, for uh, the, the streets. What amount that is is certainly up for debate, but I'd want to be able to know if we charge $1 a month, does that fall off versus charging $10 a month? Or um, So I, I guess I'd be looking for... Uh, and we heard it in some of the emails that were supportive to understand that a charge would be um, uh, associated uh, with that. But I'd, I'd want to be able to, to kind of put the rubber where the road is, like, you know, how many people are actually going to pay. So I, I don't know if we have the skill set to figure out that program or that aspect of the, the program tonight in, in the council, but I would turn to Councillor Bagley and as a representative of the PTS if, if there is something in the works on that. So thank you, Mayor. I had the exact same idea. Um, let's start charging and see what the drop off is. Uh, but then upon further reflection and, and discussion with Director Fletcher, um, it kind of skews the data. So if you do a, a 12 month trial, but three of those months, there's a totally different variable. It's not really a good representation. 
So what I might propose uh, after Labor Day is now that we have a year's worth of data, um, one, we should uh, survey the neighborhood and, and give them options. Would you participate at $100 a year? Would you participate at $200 a year or whatever the case may be? Get some of that initial feedback. Um, but that feedback is you know, not as good as people actually taking out their, their wallet and paying for it. Um, so what we could potentially do if we decide to continue on with the program is to tack on in that fall and see how many subscribers we get to it. But I think it would be, from an engineering standpoint, to to look at a year's worth of data. If you make changes to the program, it kind of invalidates the data a little bit. Okay, Councilor Moreau. I sort of like the idea of get the data through the end of the first year of running it, and then run it through the end of the calendar year with some sort of fee. And maybe it's a small fee, maybe it's the fee you want, I don't know, just a fee to sort of see how many people want to continue the program when they actually have to pay $10 a month or whatever, per car, whatever that case might be. Okay. All right. Uh, so what, uh, can we restate the motion on the floor? Uh, or Kelly, do you want to restate the motion that you have? On the floor, do we have a, we have a motion? Yes, we, we do. do. Yes. <laughs> um, let me just find it here. I think Councillor. Uh, he made it up. I could he made it repeat up. it, oh, he but made it, up. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. it wasn't a very long one. Uh, move to continue the neighborhood parking program until Labor Day uh, weekend as currently configured. Okay. On a roll call? Uh, no. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Your Honor, if, if I might, I'll try, I'll try not to bring up as many contentious oh, issues okay. from the same meeting again in the future. <laughs> All right, well, we'll see. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. You're on your PTS. It's nothing's easy on PTS. Yeah. Thank you, Ben. I appreciate it. Y'all have a good night. Okay, next uh, is uh, is my name. Let me just pull up the. So under my name, we have a, um, a verbal update on the demolition committee. Uh, I'm going to read the uh, the legal department memo um, that encapsulates where we are on this. Uh, March fifteenth. Of 2021, the City Council voted to request a report back regarding the demolition ordinance from the Demolition Review Committee, the HDC, and the Planning Board. Specifically, the City Council requested a report back from the Planning Board, HDC, and Demolition Committee on how to improve the Demolition Committee. This will include, but not limited, to deterrence uh, for the demolition of Portsmouth buildings, fines for misconduct, and public comments at meetings. Also, incentives for uh, preservation of historical buildings. On April 12th, uh, 2021, that uh, the DRC discussed proposed revisions to the demolition ordinance, uh, which I memorialized in a memorandum. The HDC and the Planning Board never discussed the proposed revisions to the demolition ordinance, and the item expired at the end of the last uh, council term. I would simply ask that we uh, we we ask the Planning Board um, and uh, or that we re-refer this to the both the Planning Board uh, and. Uh, the HDC, um, and if I get a motion, I'll discuss it. So moved, first, or, and then a, a second. I'll second. Okay, for discussion. Um, may I? Yep. Um, so I was the chair of the Demolition Review Committee, and I went back and actually re-listened to our last meeting, which was February 10th, 2021. Uh, that was when we had had the first time someone who had demolished an entire building without actually, uh, which didn't have a permit to do so. So we had a lot of things that were discussed. I forgot how contentious it was till I re-listened to it all over again. Um, but we did get to the end, and we had um, sort of three suggestions, or th two or three areas that we wanted the legal department to get us some language around. And it was, um, you know, to make people who demo without permission to base, do they have to go through the whole process again? There was questions about whether or not you would charge a penalty if, uh, penalty if you didn't follow. Uh, we wanted better definitions of what was a partial uh, 
demolition to a full, just to make sure it was very clear for the code enforcement side of things. Uh, we also talked about whether or not we wanted to do longer time frames because really demolition review has no teeth other than to delay a project. We can't make them not demolish it. Um, we asked to have those uh, changes sent back to us to review and I don't remember us ever actually getting those. So I'm thinking they must have gone to the city council to review uh, and then I did not know about the um, split then out to the other boards because obviously I was on planning board but we never actually saw any of those changes. So. Um, I can wait until other business, but I was going to make a motion that um, those requirements as originally requested actually uh, get sent yeah, to the planning board to be reviewed. I think the planning board really should see it first and review it and get their feedback. Um, other committees can look at it if they want to. It sounds like the HDC already has. Isn't that the one they had? So uh, I don't believe so, but I think that sounds like a good idea. Um, and I'll, um, if you want to, I, I will... Uh, Rescind my motion, Kelly. So strike okay. that motion. And if <laughs> Councilor Moreau would like to make uh, that uh, motion of uh, the language which was memorialized in a memorandum that Bob has already written, so no more work for Bob uh, on on this. Um, if we could just yeah. a motion similar to that to send that to the planning board. Yep, I would make the motion that we send to the planning board the requested changes that were outlined in the demolition review committee meeting of. February 10th, 2021. Second. All in favor? Oh, oh sorry. A um, <laughs> Councilor Bagley, Councilor Brody. I just have a, a comment on this, and, and this, it, it was probably back a couple years ago, it came up a bunch of times, and uh, there's a member of the community who, who have a great deal of respect for, and as we all know, we're at Dillon's rural state. And I would ask that uh, we identify the enabling legislation in the RSA that allows for a demolition committee. Okay. As part of that report back. Council um, Lombardi. Um, yeah, there's another form of demolition. It's, um, it's termed uh, demolition by ne neglect. And um, I think that the committee should look at that. I don't know what the RSAs say about that. Um, but uh, it is, we're just, we've seen a beautiful house on, um, Woodbury Avenue, uh, just oh, yeah. right. sitting there. Yeah. I think that there's uh, uh, there's there's plenty of desire to, to preserve um, by by many. Um, I, I would uh, I would caution against uh, you know as Councillor uh, uh, Moreau stated that there's very uh, little when it comes to private property uh, rights and, and what we can ask for good reason. That's mm -hmm. your private property and. You can do so which you see fit, uh, but if uh, there can be a review and, and process of that and potential incentives, especially incentives that uh, would, would, would help preserve some of the historic character uh, of, of some of these buildings, I think that would go a long way. So understanding all of, you know, that we're not a home rule state, uh, that uh, we are a subdivision of the state of New Hampshire, as I'm reminded often when I think of what revenue we could get. Um, it is, uh, it would be a, a good conversation, but one that uh, the expectation uh, has, to, has to be, I believe, that um, private property rights throughout the country, and especially in New Hampshire, are preserved um, and valued, and this would no, you know, not change that, but maybe find a win-win for people that are looking to do that in neighborhoods that would like to preserve the character. So, any other comments? All right. Uh, all in favor? Aye. Aye. And the next uh, appointments to be considered, uh, Herb Lloyd to the Sustainable Practices Blue Ribbon Committee, uh, and then uh, Margot Doring, uh, Regan Rudig, and Jonathan Wyckoff to the HDC. Uh, again, those will come up uh, at next um, council meeting, and you have the applications uh, in the packet uh, this evening. Happy to hear and discuss any of those um, before uh, next Tuesday or next a week uh, next Tuesday, uh, a week, uh, two weeks from uh, tonight. And then I will, um, I will pass the gavel to the assistant mayor. Get something to slam on. Um, and the, oh, you have the, the gavel, so you can call on the next item. Oh, first time for everything. Um, city council members, uh, Mayor McCurkin, I always, I'll get it someday. 
<laughs> Your Honor and Councillor Tabor and Councillor Denton. Um, item for review, City Manager Evaluation Committee. Uh, sample motion would be to move in accordance with the City Manager Employment Agreement. It, it is the intent of the City Council to negotiate a new agreement with the City Manager. So I would await a sample motion. Uh, so moved, Your Honor. Second. Open any discussion. I could speak to that. Uh, would uh, very much uh, love to um, negotiate a new uh, agreement uh, with the city manager. And as you will find in your emails uh, today, a request to fill out an evaluation. Uh, we've also asked for this evaluation to become part of the contract uh, to better align uh, what we base the, the work on, uh, as well as uh, making sure that the public is uh, aware of that and that the goals are being met um, and look forward to, to that discussion and hopefully everybody fills out uh, their survey as quickly as possible. Councilor Bagley. Um, I, I don't know if this is the right time to, to talk about it or not, but I, I think it should go in the public record. Uh, you know, the way I look at the council is we're kind of akin to a board of directors and, and uh, the city manager is maybe the captain of the ship. And uh, you know, sometimes in public comment, we hear that there's there's too much trust in the city manager. Or we're letting the city manager do things, and uh, you know, from my personal perspective, uh, the captain of the ship should be doing things. And I certainly would want to have a very high level of trust in the captain of the ship. And if I didn't, I would see that as a big problem. Um, so I'm not going to give away my evaluation, but I think very highly of our our city manager. I think uh, she was dealt as we all were a pretty unfair hand with COVID just as she came on the job. Um, and in my travels around the country, I think Portsmouth has come through COVID a lot better than other municipalities. So uh, for me, the proof is in the pudding, but I, I just wanted to put out there in the public record that uh, I trust the city manager greatly, and I think she's doing a fantastic job. Any more discussion? All in favor? Aye. Pass this bad layer back. <laughs> Thank you, Assistant Mayor. Uh, next up, we have Councillor Tabor and Councillor Denton uh, on the item of the city manager's contract. Uh, thanks, Your Honor. <clears throat> well, we decided the direction we want to go, and this next motion is how we would go about it. Um, and our subcommittee of the mayor and Councillor Denton and myself discussed it with Kelly Harper, uh, and we thought that uh, probably the most efficient way to do this is to have our labor attorney um, begin the negotiations, and that's, so I'll read the motion. Um, authorize the city's labor attorney to negotiate the city manager's upcoming employment contract, communicating with the city council as needed, and subject to the council's performance evaluation <coughs> and approval. Second. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. All right. Next up, we have uh, going back to Councillor Tabor on the subject of uh, uh, community engagement with a sample of motion moved to receive a report back uh, from staff on best practices and new technology for citizen engagement and schedule uh, council work session. Uh, I would make that motion, Your Honor, and if I get a second, I'll second. Okay. Um, I enclosed a, a slide deck for you all to take a look at. Um, maybe I'm too theoretical <laughs> at times, maybe a little lost in the clouds, but um, one of our goals uh, that I really thought came out strongly in our retreat was how to invite and honor input from the community and encourage increased participation. So uh, there's a number of tools out there now that could benefit us at this. Um, I think we learned over time, or at least I have, um, being on the council, there's two types of public engagement. The first is when the city rolls out a project after many hours of council discussion and staff time, and it gets to public hearings and people say, oh no, don't do it this way, do it that way, or we disagree with this. 
Um, and the second is when the citizens are involved at the conception of a project and their advice is sought early and, and factored in. And then the project has buy-in and momentum and, and that's not to say everybody likes it, uh, but many of the people who are very passionate about it have been engaged. So I, I think a great example of that is um, back in 2007, we had to build a new middle school and there was a choice between renovating <coughs> a historic building or building something new uh, on green space up at Jones Avenue on top of a landfill. And the city was ready to roll out the let's build a new one and relocate. But there was a joint building committee with the school board and council. They were split. The council was split. Uh, the parents of the kids were split. And there had been dialogue for hours at public hearings and public comment. So the city decided to invite everyone <coughs> into uh, a different kind of dialogue where we had study circles, 11 study circles, 160 people, and they deliberated and people talked with one another and they engaged with one another. Um, and it was the, the city reaching out saying, we're going to ask you. Um, and the majority of the study circles decided to renovate the original school and I think it was done based on Portsmouth values, you know, respect for our historic buildings, preserving green space, keeping the city walkable and bikeable for kids, keeping the downtown active. So there's, we have to have public hearings, we use public comment, it has its institutional place, but I think it's not necessarily good for generating real dialogue or considering a variety of options um, and it's not necessarily good for comparing what are the best ways to go. So um, this motion that I'm offering is to help us uh, begin to expand our public engagement beyond the traditional one-way process and it's how can we go out and get input from residents to us as well as we can discuss what they have to say in return. Um, there's some interesting, really interesting things happening. Uh, I put in the packet um, flash vote, which is a way of uh, impaneling five, 600 people for instant feedback. And it's very transparent. Everybody gets the same results within 48 hours. So you, you can think of some of the issues we've wrestled with tonight. And, uh, it might be very applicable. Um, and uh, <clears throat> so in a nutshell, the goal is to work with staff and hear back uh, if they can research some of these best practices out there and best technologies so that really we can really um, make some progress over the next 8, 12, 10, 16 months on um, how do we invite community engagement, how do we encourage it, how do we increase the participation with these sort of non-traditional methods. And I added the possibility of a work session um, in the motion um, and I think it would be a good discussion. We could um, hear back from staff about that. So that's okay, Councillor Tabor, any other questions or comments? Councillor Lombardi and Councillor Cook. Yes, the um, Safe Water Committee um, used that, uh, that system for immediate feedback um, f on a very small scale um, and found it to be very useful. And so um, I, I could imagine that being expanded quite a bit. Um, I mean, we had about 30 participants um, in that, and it was um, basically surveying uh, water quality and things like that. Um, it was not a contentious or controversial subject at all, um, but um, it was a useful exercise in experimenting with this process. So I support that. Councillor Cook. Thank you, Your Honor, um, and thank you, Councillor Tabor, for introducing this subject to us. I think it's a wonderful initiative. 
Um, I particularly like the idea of being able to gather additional data um, that is um, not influenced, I guess, by public, by um, certain sides of uh, opinion on particular actions of the council. I think that's one of the things I really struggle with the most in the role as a city councilor is that whenever we, we take part or look at a new initiative, the feedback that we receive is usually from individuals that are either unhappy with the program or individuals that are immediate abutters to whatever program we're initiating, and so they feel a need to respond. But we don't get general feedback from the wider populace. And so it's very hard to make a decision based upon what you think public opinion is um, on that particular initiative. You think about the way we gather data, like, uh, for example, Fleet Street. Um, we gathered quite a bit of data on Fleet Street and design of Fleet Street, but that's an opt-in program but who wants to respond? And so you get a certain subset of the population responding and that skews the data. So it would be great if we had a way like flash vote is a great example of collecting unbiased data. And so I think this is a really important initiative to look at. Thank you. Councilor Baylock. Thank you, Art. And thank you, Councilor Tabor, for uh, bringing this up. I really appreciate you looked at other, what other towns did. Um, really thought outside the box here. And I think what better way to bring more members of our community um, into engagement with us. Um, but I think this is wonderful, even if we're just looking at new ways to um, communicate with community members. And I also like the idea of the survey. I know we've talked about shorter ways of communicating with people. Um, now that attention spans are a little shorter than they might have been in the, in the history. Um, but yeah, thank you very much. Well, uh, I I always love learning, um, and I love that I get to learn about the uh, Clarotarian, uh, which is uh, the, uh, the the little file cabinet that you pulled out by lot. Um, it is interesting that um, you know the the Athenians uh, had representative uh, democracy there. Um, so you know I don't think what you're proposing is to put everything out to a vote uh, because people elect us or those that sit in these seats for our judgment. But I do feel very strongly that um, in order to have good judgment, we need as much information as possible. And while it might not be hard uh, for any one of us uh, to get up at, at public comment and, and, and speak our mind or, or for anybody uh, who is used to doing that, I, I speak to a number of people that get drawn in uh, by an issue, good or bad, and and speak up here. And the first thing that almost inevitably they say, man, I was so scared, but I really felt passionate about this. Um, and that's their first, uh, it's their first kind of inkling into, into, into government. And they realize it's not that bad. It's just us up here and it can, you know, it gets easier. And when you talk, it gets easier um, to, to do it again. So I view this as, you know, in its, in its best form, I view it as an on-ramp to participating in Portsmouth. And if we can figure out ways to, to make it easier to do so on a level that, you know, isn't life or death to, to somebody or even, you know, an abutting issue that they feel passionate about, maybe it's just a judgment. I'd love to figure out ways. Um, and I'd love this work session, um, and I'd, I'd hope that the, um, you know, the, the work session, you know, there's some takeaways that we, we give to the governance uh, committee as a, as a pathway uh, forward to, to how do we implement them. But I'd love to learn more about this and how do we um, take advantage of technology um, or just other best practices around the, around the nation in terms of how do we get more people uh, to vote. So uh, I am in favor of this, and I will uh, have the vote. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any chance we could get a short break? Absolutely, but we got to finish up by 10.30. I just need two okay. minutes to go yeah, yeah. back. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, all right, so we'll take a five-minute recess and uh, I'll come be back, right back. Um, for the rest of the packet. Go, well, Councilor.
All right, welcome back. And we find ourselves back to Councillor Bagley. Yeah. So, <laughs> unfinished business. Um, so we've gotten through bike lanes. Uh, the first, okay, so we're on to uh, just section two uh, under your name. Um, at number one, I believe, request for renewal. Yep. Uh, thank you, Your Honor. Uh, so, Parking Traffic Safety Committee action items needing approval by the council. Um, I would move that we approve items one, three, um, under section two. In section two, as we've already discussed, section er, it, item two. Mm -hmm. So, one and three from section two. Mm -hmm. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 And then uh, item three, parking traffic safety committee action sheets and minutes of May 5th, 2022. Uh, move to accept and approve the action sheet and minutes of the May 5th, 2022 parking traffic safety committee meeting. So moved. Second. Second. And just a question, um, does this, uh, would, does this approve what we've just approved or in addition to that? Yeah, it's, it was done a little cumbersome this week because I tried to pull some stuff out. Uh, okay, got it. Okay, so uh, we're kind of reapproving what we just right. approved. We approved for the second time. All right, mm -hmm. all in favor? Aye. Aye. And then item four uh, so requesting a report back from the city on the Maple Haven and Panaway Manor sidewalk projects. And if you want, I can speak to how we ended up here. Uh, do we have, is this a verbal update? Do we have a motion? It's a verbal update. Okay. Um, so uh, would you, just for the record, could you make, the, so you're requesting a report back from the city, so that would be the motion, right? That's there? correct. Okay, so. Sec er, could you make that motion? Yeah, so I move that uh, the city report back on the Maple Haven and Panaway Manor sidewalk projects. Second. All right. All right. So. Um, the, these projects have, have been in the CIP for, for close to a decade. Um, and some of the, who requested them, why they requested them has gotten lost over the years. Uh, we sent out some surveys in Panaway. There is overwhelming support for sidewalks from the third residents who responded. In Maple Haven, there was a little bit less, but it was, it was pretty substantial support for sidewalks. Um, but there's been some, some residents have raised concerns that their support may have changed based on once we went out there and did the, the field surveys and looked at the number of trees that would have to be cut down to put the sidewalks in, what the sidewalks would look like. They're five and a half feet wide concrete so that the five foot snow plow can get down them. Um, what I want to make sure we're, we're not going to cut down trees and then find out that, oh, actually most people didn't want us to cut down these trees. So it's just a, Kind of a safety valve on the project let's make sure that now that we have finalized plans everybody's still on board with these finalized plans um, and I, I would expect the city would, might do a survey and and talk to the neighborhoods and maybe possibly have uh, one more e meeting each for those neighborhoods before we move forward to, uh, kind of past the point of no return and the mayor. thank you and to can continue on um, what Councillor Bagley was saying, we've, we've also discussed within the city and hopefully get a report back of potentially breaking up these projects. I know that they were in the CIP as one group um, item, but maybe breaking them up to see if we can get some traction on them while appeasing um, all the neighborhoods. I will add that the State Street project is moving forward. Um, so there were three sidewalk projects total. Um, I will say my inherent bias as a councillor is I am on the pro sidewalk camp, which I guess I didn't even know there was a pro and anti sidewalk camp until recently. Um, but once we cut down these trees, we can't put them back up. So I, I think it's prudent to to take a, a good hard look at this before we move forward. Sister Mayor. Yes, I, I would know because I just want to make it very clear to the public that the city has a, has a great uh, greenery and, and tree committee and, and we do replant trees in areas when they are removed. and. I just know that sometimes there's this notion that, you know, I think it just happened on um, over on Pierce Island and, and Fortree that we had to cut down some diseased trees and, and um, 
people just thought we were removing trees to remove trees. So I like to make it very clear that we have an amazing arborist. DPW does a great job, and so does the Greenery and Tree Committee to make sure that when trees are removed for projects like this, that new trees are planted, um, and so that the and you know the environment, that neighborhood feel, the sound protection, the heat protection is still there. Any other questions? I just had one question when you said uh, split out on State Street still occurring. When do we expect to get the, uh, we've bid those out uh, at least two different ways, maybe three. Um, when do we expect to get those bids back and when can the public expect to have uh, this on the council agenda for us to discuss? Right, I'm happy to take that, Your Honor. We recently, as in last week, put out the bid for the State Street project and we expect bids in back in the three to four week time frame, which would make it too late for that first June council meeting, but certainly in time for the second June council meeting, and definitely that the option the city council preferred would take place this summer. What we need to do is, in, in reference to what the council has discussed and in deference to the trees and greenery conversation that, that brought up the, the, the notion that perhaps there is not the consensus we may have thought prior to trees and greenery meeting and discussing the tree removal, that city staff would hold one more, as Councilor Bagley suggested, one more neighborhood meeting for each area, both Maple Haven and Panaway, and um, make sure that both sides of the conversation understand all the ramifications of, of undertaking the project. And would that push uh, any discussion or any, I guess, uh, project <coughs> into the next year because of we wouldn't be bidding these for this, or could we bid them later and still hit the construction window? What we would do is once we take into account the different opinions of the different neighborhoods, it would, from a timing perspective, be something where we would put out bids in the fall for work next spring for those two neighborhoods, in okay. whole or in part. Uh, and then just from a, a budget standpoint, would this then be reflected in this year's budget or, or next year's budget? It would stay within the 23 budget because it would be work within the FY23 okay, so it's still still there. realm. Okay. Yep. All right. Uh, Councilor Bagley. Uh, maybe this is a question for Director Rice. I don't want to spill the beans on what might be the worst kept secret in town these days, but since the Assistant Mayor mentioned it, uh, we do have some big plans uh, with planting trees upcoming next year. I don't know if anybody from the city wants to speak to that or if we're going to wait for a bigger announcement about that. Well, we're a tree city and we like to plant lots of trees. so. Um, I'm looking at Peter, and I think we'll make a, a more comprehensive announcement, but um, I think without um, speaking out of turn, we, we try to plant at least 100 trees a year. We would look to uh, quadruple that for the 400, so we would look to plant, with the assistance of groups like the Rotary Club and others, a total of 400 trees next year. All right. Thank you, City Manager. Sure. Um, so uh, with that, the, the motion on the floor... Uh, is to uh, re a, a report back uh, from the city manager on the Maple Haven and Panaway sidewalk projects. Is that, did I read that, remember that correctly? Mm -hmm. Yes. thereabouts? Mm -hmm. Okay. Any other discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 All right. Councilor Bagley, you're done. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, no approvals of grants <coughs> or donations. Um, and then we are left with the city manager's informational items. Your Honor, uh, similar to conversation at last council meeting about the status of the demolition committee and their findings, we heard requests for information and updates on where we stand with PFAS sampling at the new athletic fields. We've provided a short update, and the update really says you'll get, we will be able to provide you with a more thorough and comprehensive update for another two to three weeks for the work that our uh, independent third party tester, TRC, can to, um, can undertake to get the information to us in a manner that we can share with you. So it is anticipated that at one of the June meetings we will come back with a more thorough PFAS update. So that is number one. We've um, The other one is, uh, as mentioned at our budget presentation last week, our chief building inspector has brought the inspection department to a status in just uh, six short months where he and his staff uh, are caught up with the backlog. They're proud to be able to go back to uh, offering office hours to allow residents, contractors, and developers to have in-person meetings with the inspection team without having to schedule an appointment. 
people will remember that in the pre-COVID days. The additional benefit of office hours is that our inspectors can have an improved opportunity to field calls, meet with folks, return emails, and be available for really critical cross-departmental collaboration, which uh, Shanti Wolf has really done a wonderful job in spearheading. So starting uh, today, we are offering office hours every Monday from 8 to 10 a.m. and 5 to 6 p.m., and every Tuesday through Friday from 8 to 10 a.m. No appointments. Feel free to walk in. Uh, someone from the inspection team will be glad to, to work with you. Excellent. Anything under miscellaneous? I have one thing, if I may, Your Honor. With uh, Memorial Day coming up, I just wanted to give a quick overview of what people could expect if they want to participate in the Memorial Day events. So on Friday, May 27th at 1030, it's going to be the Burial at Sea. That's in Prescott Park. It's the smaller ceremony of the ones that we're doing. But we are planning on bringing back the uh, Portsmouth Memorial Day Parade. It steps off at 1 o'clock on Monday, the 30th of May. Uh, the parade follows the same route. It's followed in the past, essentially, starting at the intersection of Junkins Ave and Parrot, going through downtown, uh, then out to intersection Middle Street, continue down Middle Street, make a left down to Richards, and then go up into the South Street Cemetery. Uh, the actual ceremony portion is set to begin at 2 o'clock, where it will be speaking and then the only changes afterwards instead of having a small cookout in the city hall's lower lot uh, the bfw met with actually deputy chief howe this morning to do a cookout in prescott park instead which we've been working with health Department on so everyone's welcome to all events obviously the council and the public thank you councillor denton councillor bagley uh thank you your honor i just uh uh want to thank everybody so my dad passed away a couple weeks ago and, and the mayor said some very nice things uh, at the start of the meeting um, but he also gave me some some excellent advice on the the phone and a huge number of people reached out to me uh, through uh, text or flowers or, or cards and it was greatly appreciated it's uh, a lot more challenging than I thought it would be um, and and the support of the community has been uh, fantastic so I just want to say thank you to everyone Thank you, Councillor Bagley. It's a uh, may his memory be a blessing, and it certainly is having talked to you uh, on that. Councillor Lombardi. I would just like to remind people that the state of the city is being presented tomorrow morning. Uh, our city manager will be presenting at uh, the chamber, and it's at the Pease Golf Course um, Grill Country 28. Club. Grill 28. <laughs> Sorry, I just um, <laughs> this is actually one of the, the hottest tickets in town, so it's it's sold out, and they're not allowing walk-ups. So I think there might be a way to get there on Zoom, um, but if you show up, you you may be turned away at the door, unfortunately. Or at the tent, I believe it's outside. It's under outside a tent, under a so. tent. Yes. Okay. Uh, Councillor Tabor. Wow, this is a, uh, this I know, you're, a record for miscellaneous you're, here. You're wagging that gavel. <laughs> He's ready. Uh, I just, uh, going back to the bike lanes, I wanted to ask Director Rice how long we might be in the temporary situation with the stripes. Um, Would it be more appropriate to provide a, a written report at our next that's meeting? That's fine. That, yeah. I'm not looking to shush Peter. I would never okay, do that. Okay, if that's a motion. <laughs> Second. All in favor for a written report back on the uh, the, the Middle Street uh, repaving planning effort. Okay. That'd be Aye. Great. Aye. 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 Mr. Mayor, I have another. Well, I just had I had one thing. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it was just to, to remind Portsmouth or to let Portsmouth know that the family dance, due to low ticket sales, um, has been canceled for Friday evening, which I'm incredibly bummed about. And Tiernan. Is, uh, is equally sad um, about. So uh, we're going to work to find another date, um, and uh, we will uh, endeavor. I will, I will uh, try to uh, do my bit, and I'd ask everybody else uh, to, uh, as well, to, to promote that uh, more aggressively so we have um, a, a, a great family dance at the community center, and we're sorry that, uh, that we have to cancel it you know the people that did sign up i'm sure were really energetic and enthused dancers like myself and my daughter uh but it's always fun to dance with more people so uh look for a date uh to come and i believe the city manager has an item at the risk of piling on i would like to inform the council 
that uh, pursuant to section 1.303 of the ordinance uh, and um, as I am a member of one of two ex-officio members to serve on the planning board, I, I am looking to inform you that I will appoint Joe Almeida, our facilities manager, who's an architect by training, has spent a lot of time uh, as, um, as a helpful member of the HDC, that Joe will replace Ray Pizzullo, has re who has retired from employee with the city of Portsmouth, and uh, therefore Joe will serve with me as ex officio members on the planning board starting this Thursday. Thank you. He'll be a great addition. And thank great. you to uh, Ray for your many years of service uh, to the city and on the planning board. Uh, and good luck, Joe, uh, on the, uh, the, uh, the planning board. With no other uh, comments or questions under miscellaneous, uh, I'm going to close the meeting. Uh, uh, stay safe, Portsmouth, and uh, enjoy uh, the rest of this week. Mm.